Hi, this is an Alt-Shift-X live stream. We're going to talk about House of the Dragon, episode 8. We're going to answer your questions, and we are not going to spoil future episodes, and we're going to have a good time. And my god, what, what an episode this was. We've had another time skip, so our characters, the kids, have been aged up again, and some of the kids have had their own kids. I don't know, well, I don't think they actually mentioned Aegon and Helena's children yet, but they're around. And Daemon and Rhaenyra have had kids, called Aegon and Viserys. Which does make things confusing, because we already have an Aegon as the child of Viserys and Alicent. Uh, and we also had Jace and Luke recast as older versions of themselves, Bela and Rhaena as well. And we see that, um... In King Viserys's last days, all the adults are keen to make peace and to prevent conflict. They decide that now, at the very last minute, is a great time to start making peace and all getting along again. Um, but alas, the children are not so forgiving. I thought that was really wonderful, the way that happened. Because they had this wonderful, awkward Thanksgiving dinner with Alicent's side of the family and Rhaenyra's side of the family all together, with Viserys trying to finally make peace among his people. And while the adults, while Alicent and Rhaenyra were genuinely trying to make a go of, of getting along, it was their children who were not. It was their children who continued the generational conflict that they learned from their parents. So just after everything was kind of going okay and everyone was getting along, Amond Targaryen gives his shit-stirring speech, insulting Jace and Luke and calling them strongs, and the fight starts anew. The fight that the adults trained them for, you know? Just like with the fight in the previous episode. These adults have been treating these kids... Alicent's kids and Rhaenyra's kids as though they are enemies, teaching them to fight, teaching them that bastardy is this shameful secret that you can use to hurt each other, so of course they keep on fighting. So, you know, despite the adults' attempts to make some peace in this episode, the inertia of their of their conflict continues. Um, and now and now the king is dead. Ring the bells, the king is dead. Viserys died. And uh, thanks for the donation from Ludacris, who says that... Um, who says that it's weird that prophecy motivating Alicent is a strange decision. I think there's a few ways to interpret what what happened here, because in Viserys's last moments, he was speaking to Alicent, and Viserys thought that he was speaking to Rhaenyra, continuing their earlier conversation about Aegon's prophecy. And so Viserys says that, like, oh, the, uh, the prince that was promised and Aegon... And, and and the the dream about the White Walkers and everything. Viserys is talking about Aegon's prophecy, and he's talking about Aegon the Conqueror, the guy who conquered Westeros those years ago. Whereas Alicent, the way she interprets Viserys's words, uh, she thinks that Viserys is talking about her son Aegon. Prince Aegon, she says. And, like, I, I don't think that's a very reasonable interpretation of what Viserys is saying, right? Um, I think Alicent chooses to believe that Viserys is talking about her son being the rightful heir to the throne. Um, I think Alice, uh, that's that's on Alicent, not on um, Viserys. But Viserys was full of drugs, so um, full of milk of the poppy. So, you know, I think this is on Alicent if she chooses to interpret Viserys' words as being about her son Aegon. I, I don't think Alicent is going like, ooh, White Walkers. Like, Alicent is not really interpreting this as a prophecy thing. I think that she's interpreting this as a Viserys wants my son to be king thing, which is not at all what he meant. Uh, we also had um, dramatically come to a head with Vaymond trying to get himself to be the next lord of Driftmark instead of Lucerys, Rhaenyra's son. And, uh, and the king unexpectedly turned up and laid down the law one last time in support of his grandson, Luke. And then Daemon cut off Vaemon's head, which was which was wonderful and I was not expecting. 
Thanks for the super chat from Jiro, who says, They were so close to avoiding the Dance of the Dragons, only to be set back on the path by Viserys being senile and high. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the thing that I kept thinking was, Viserys, in this moment, should have legitimized Luke and Jace. Because that's a thing that, that kings can do. Like, if someone is a bastard, and so they don't have the right of inheritance and whatever... A king can say, I legitimize you. I make you no longer a bastard. You are now a true-born heir. Like, I mean, Roose Bolton, with, with King Joffrey's permission, did that with Ramsay Snow, making him into Ramsay Bolton. And Aegon IV Targaryen made his bastard children legitimized. Viserys should have done the same with Jace and Luke, I reckon. He should have said, okay, fine, like, they are bastards, but I legitimize them, therefore they're inheritance is unquestionable. I mean, the issue there is that if Viserys legitimized Luke, Luke would have no claim to Driftmark. Um, if, you know, Viserys admitted that Luke is actually Harwin Strong's son, not Lainor Valerion's son. But I don't know. I feel like this was an opportunity to make things even more clear and Viserys did not quite go far enough. Because, I mean, that that's the issue is that Vaymond... Vaymond is telling the truth. All Vaymond is saying here is that Luke and Jace are bastards and they should not inherit Driftmark. And I think Vaymond is sympathetic in this moment because he talks about how his house, House Valerion, is one of the last Valyrian houses. They have this ancient, unique history that is, to some extent, erased if Luke becomes the new Lord of Driftmark. Because he's, he doesn't have Valerion blood, and Valerion blood does have some Valyrian magic to it. And if the new lord is does not have Valerion blood, then that is like an end to that bloodline. So I think Vaymond is sympathetic in that extent. Although you could also point out that, well, if Luke marries Reyna Targaryen, which is the plan, then his children will have some true Valerion blood through Lena Valerion. So... Okay. We had some technical issues, but it should be better. Sorry about that. Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Jacob and from Wayne and from Jarek, who said that Vizzy made a WWE entrance. I loved Viserys's entrance, opening the doors midway through the speech, walking in slow. Even his costume with the mask and everything, like it's decrepit and creepy, but it's also kind of badass. The Return of the King, I loved it. I was real scared that Viserys was going to fall and, like, cut himself on the throne. Because that's something that um, happens in the books, is that Viserys, like, trips and falls and slices his hand open on the Iron Throne. Um, and I was terrified that that was going to happen. But it was so beautiful and it was so sweet when Daemon came and supported his brother going up the throne. I thought that was a really lovely show of affection and devotion and support from a brother who has otherwise been a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, so that was lovely. And I wonder, like, you know, I think that Viserys' death is going to be a huge deal to Daemon because, you know, he has been so motivated by a desire for love from Viserys. Like, so much of his whole issue has been about, you know, not feeling appreciated enough by Viserys. And now that Viserys is dead, it's like, you know, where's Daemon going to seek affection from now? I get, you know, I mean, Daemon is a family man now, you know, like he's got, he's got two kids with Rhaenyra, right? he's got two kids with Lena. Um, maybe that's where Daemon's satisfaction and identity comes from now. I, I really enjoyed like the uh, sequence where Daemon was like climbing around on Dragonstone, on the Dragonmont, which is like the volcanic... Uh, mountain next to the Dragonstone Castle, and he went and found a new clutch of eggs laid by Cyrax. And I love, I love the look of this clutch of eggs because it's in this weird sort of pod, this sort of like hot. It, it looks like a bloody xenomorph egg. I was expecting a face hugger to burst out of this this weird pod that Daemon pulled the eggs out of. But we, we've never seen this or had this described in the books or the shows before. Uh, but I really enjoyed Daemon retrieving those eggs he seems to have a, a passion for the uh, dragon eggs and, and of course you know that's a big symbol for his children like daemon's children with rhaenyra aegon and viserys um they will perhaps get those eggs if they didn't already have eggs they might get those eggs so they can have dragons of their own uh, thanks for the super chats from jacob and elond green 
and Patrick says, where was Joffrey? Yeah, so we did get a brief look at Joffrey Valarion, who is the child of Rhaenyra and Harwin, supposedly Laenor. Uh, we saw him briefly around here. Oh, that, that, that's him down there. We saw a brief look of Joffrey, um, which is the first time we've seen him since he was a little baby. But yeah, we saw Joffrey, and so Joffrey is the brother of, of Jason Luke. Yeah, there he is. There's little Joffrey. Lots of little kids running around now. Thanks for the super chat from Inquisitor, who says, Is Crab Eater time traveling Vizzy like Tyrion is Danny's time traveling fetus? Are you suggesting that Viserys is the crab feeder? Is that what you're suggesting? So, like, they both wear they both wear golden masks. I can see the similarity between Viserys' mask and the crab feeder's mask. So what you're saying is that when Viserys died at the end of the episode, he actually traveled through time and became the crab feeder pirate, and then Viserys killed his own brother. That's an interesting theory. Uh, Jacob asks, do you think Viserys saw Emma when he died? Yeah, I thought, that w I thought Viserys' death was so beautiful and sad, and his last words... His last words were, I think, referring to Emma. Um, his last words are, my love. And I think, I think it's Emma, because, like, the writers and the actor have talked about how Viserys... Viserys is very much motivated by love for his dead wife, Emma Arryn, who is the mother of Rhaenyra, and that, Rhaeny and that Viserys' support for... Uh, Rhaenyra is largely an act of love and devotion and guilt for his wife Emma, who he still feels guilty about the death of um, when he had to cut her open because she had a baby inside her that was killing her. So that was a whole thing. And um, yeah, I thought that was really lovely. A wonderful performance by Viserys and real, real horrifying seeing the way they, the way his body was breaking down. I thought that was done quite effectively as well. Uh, thanks for the donation from Slevin, who says, Was it just me, or did it look like Amond was intimidated by Daemon when they stared at each other after punches were thrown? Yeah, I mean, Amond, Amond gets his power from being like this, you know, tough, scary, no-nonsense fighter. But then he gets sort of stared down by Daemon, who is like the one person in the room who is a, you know, tougher, scarier, more dangerous, more chaotic dude. Um, so I think that's definitely a uh, rivalry we can uh, keep our eyes on, pun intended. I really enjoyed when they put a pig down in front of Amond. I don't know if that was, like, intentional or not. Like, do you think that Jace and Luke, like, specifically told the waiter, Hey, Amond really likes pork. Could you maybe put a pig in front of him? Because this, of course, calls back to the Pink Dread, which was the pig that Luke and Aegon gave to Amond episodes ago to tease him. Um, so, you know, we can see how those old, all the old bullying and all the old rivalries are still very much, uh, still very fresh for these guys. And of course the eye, I think Amon is very much concerned by, uh, the eye being lost. So, um, so yeah, it was wonderful to see the pink dread and Amon getting all pissy. I, I thought that, uh, it was really lovely to see Helena as well. We've seen Helena in a couple of episodes previously. She says another weird, um cryptic thing again which i'm i don't know what this one means what in the chat what do you guys think it means when helena says beware the beast beneath the boards what does she mean by that I, is she talking about something beneath the floorboards beneath the boards of a bed is she talking about like spies and little birds inside the walls of the red keep under the floors is she what what is i mean is she talking about the sort of metaphorical hatred you guys are suggesting that it's um, yeah okay. So we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna give any spoilers, but uh, yeah, there is an incident later on that uh, she may be referring to. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Uh, I like how they have kept sort of reminding us throughout the season of the various passages in the Red Keep. Um, but then after Helena said another cryptic thing, she actually said something coherent for the first time. 
Um, she just gets up and talks about how shit her husband is, which I found very funny. Uh, because, of course, you know, Aegon and Helena are married, brother and sister, Targaryen incest. But Helena just gets up and gives a speech about how, well, like, you know, married life isn't so bad. Your husband mostly just ignores you and has sex with other people, except for when he's drunk. Which kind of reminds me of the Robert Baratheon and Cersei Lannister marriage, which, you know, similarly, Robert mostly sort of ignored Cersei except for when he was drunk. So it's a bit dark, but it's also fun to see Helena actually speak in, like, coherent sentences for once. Like, she actually appears to know what's going on in the world around her for once. Uh, so that's fun to see. And Otto, I, I thought there was a lovely shot of Otto where Otto looked uh, rather proud of... Uh, of Helena. Otto smiles and says good to Helena after Helena gives a speech, like, talking shit about her husband Aegon, which gives me the sense that, you know, Otto has been uh, trying to get Helena to, I don't know, act normal or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I, I enjoyed Helena. And Helena did this wonderful dance with, uh, with Jace, which was fun. And Aegon was um, being an absolute uh, dickhead, which was also entertaining. So, you know, I, I think that these new actors playing the kids are, um, are doing a good job. Uh, Robbie, thanks for the super chat, says, Legitimizing the boys means admitting that Rhaenyra has been committing treason by passing them off as trueborn. That crime can't be uncommitted. Uh, yeah, so I was saying before that, you know, maybe Viserys should legitimize Rhaenyra's bastard kids. Um, and yeah, it would mean admitting that Rhaenyra, like, committed treason, um, in having those bastards in the first place. But I mean, I, I think that for the stability of the realm, it's still on balance might be better. Like, like, it's all about the king, like, putting his support behind those kids, which I'm not sure he did enough. But yeah, you do make a fair point. Um, but again, like, you can, you can question, like, there's also, like, the gendered aspect of it. Like, Rhaenyra having bastards is seen as a terrible crime when Aegon having bastards is not. And all of Aegon's fucking around. Like, I really enjoyed the scene where a serving girl um, was confronted by Alicent because Aegon had sex with this serving girl. Um, she didn't want to, so, you know, this may have been a rape situation. And so Alicent confronts her, and she sort of... She, she reminded me very much of Cersei Lannister, Alicent's performance here, where she was, like... She was being... Uh, she was, like, looking after her and, like, pr acting protective in one sense, but she was also threatening her by saying, oh, you know what happens to girls who, who do what you did? Um, I worry about what others believe. So she was really, like, threatening and manipulating this girl in a way that reminded me of how Cersei threatened and manipulated Sansa in Game of Thrones. Um, and I also got a sense of, like, vindictiveness from Alicent, as though Alicent was sort of taking out her spite and frustration on um, this girl. What, what was her name? Di Diana? Di Diane? I got the sense that Alicent was sort of taking out some aggression on this girl uh, in the same way that Alicent felt spite against Rhaenyra for her sexuality. I feel like Alicent was sort of wielding a similar tool against uh, this poor girl here. And I thought this, it was a really great performance by this girl as well. She she seemed so scared in a way that felt very real, I, I thought. Um, and, you know, it's also cool how Alicent is using the faith as her sort of weapon. In the Inside the episode, the creators talked about Alicent turning to the faith as a sort of act of penitence after Alicent's outburst in the previous episode when she cut Rhaenyra. So Alicent has sort of responded by using religion to sort of reassure herself and re-empower herself and um, replacing the Targaryen symbology with Faith of the Seven symbology also has a political element because House Hightower is very close to the Faith of the Seven. And of course, like, you know, Rhaenyra's sins of adultery and Rhaenyra's sins of having those bastards, um, you know, having the Faith of the Seven is is a... Is a um, you know, condemnation of Rhaenyra's actions as well. So, lots going on there. Um, and, you know, the faith ties to House Hightower and everything. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Yennefer, who says, I think we learned a valuable lesson this episode. Don't name everyone freaking Aegon. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, like, in Viserys' last moments, par part of the issue with... Viserys and Alicent and the misunderstanding here is that there's too many bloody Aegons. 
Um, because Viserys is talking about Aegon the First, but Alicent thinks that he's talking about her son, Alicent, her son Aegon the Elder, he's called. Uh, but there's also now another Aegon, uh, who is called Aegon the Younger, who is the son of Rhaenyra and Daemon. Um, and then, you know, there's also Aegon the Uncrowned, who was killed by Maegor previously. And then, like, after that, there's Aegon the Fourth and, and Fifth. And there's so, and then Jon Snow is apparently called Aegon Targaryen in the show canon. So many bloody Aegons. So really, House Targaryen brought this on themselves. Uh, and, you know, like, like the whole, you know, Rhaenyra and Daemon naming their, their son Aegon is... It, it is a political act to rival uh, Alicent's son, Aegon, because, you know, calling your kid Aegon is a symbol of, like, positioning your child as a Targaryen king. Um, so naming their kid Aegon, he, that sort of makes that kid a rival um, and a rival claimant to the throne against um, Alicent's child, Aegon. Thanks for the super chat from Chaos Ballerina, who says, Still no Daeron? Yeah, so in the books, there is a fourth child of Viserys and Alicent called Daeron. Um, and he's like the one who isn't a dickhead. He's like, he's just sort of a good natured, nice kid who everyone likes, as opposed to Aegon and Aemon, who are terrible. Um, and I, I think that Daeron probably will turn up at some point because there are four bloodstreams um, coming from Alicent in the opening sequence uh, at the start of each episode, uh, suggesting that there are four kids uh, of Alicent, just like in the books. Uh, yeah, here, it's very small and blurry, but that represents Alicent, and those four bloodstreams, I think, represent her four children. So I think that Daeron does exist in Hot Day, we just haven't seen him yet, and it's possible that Daeron is currently um, at Old Town because he gets fostered at Old Town in the books, so he might turn up later. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Tadpole, who says Vaymond getting his head cut in half made me audibly gasp. Wow! And I love the channel. Thanks for the great content. Thank you, Tadpole. Yeah, I thought it was wonderful uh, how Viserys was like, oh, "I will have your tongue, Vaymond. We'll cut out your tongue for saying that Jason Luca bastards." And then Viserys just, uh, then then Daemon out of nowhere just cuts Vaemon's head in half, which was like, whoa. And I, yeah, I was not expecting that because that is a change from the books, um, the way that that went down. Um, but I liked, I liked, I liked the way Vaemon's head just got goddamn chopped in half like a piece of fruit, just like cleanly through his skull. Because that reminds us that like Valyrian steel is extremely sharp and extremely strong more than regular steel it's like a you know the westerosi equivalent of a lightsaber um it reminds us that there is a difference between valyrian steel and regular steel um da dark sister is the name of daemon's valyrian steel sword and so i liked seeing that you know seeing its sharpness and i also enjoyed the way they used the valerion succession crisis because this is a little bit different compared to in the books um but I like how, you know, the Hightowers were using the the Valerion succession crisis. Like, will Vaemon Valerion be the next Lord of Driftmark? Or will Luke Valerion, Rhaenyra's son, be the next Lord of Driftmark? And the Hightowers, like Alicent and Otto, were using this as a way to erode Jace and Luke and Rhaenyra's claims to the throne. Because the Hightowers were going, okay, like, if we give Driftmark to Vaemond instead of to Luke, that sort of suggests that Luke is not legitimate, without actually saying that Luke is not legitimate. Like, if we disinherit Luke of Driftmark, the next step is to disinherit Jace of the throne and Rhaenyra of the throne. So it's it's smart. It's a sort of like a prelude. It's like a gradual slope towards, you know, just gradually eroding Rhaenyra's family's legitimacy. It's a very sneaky Otto Hightower sort of a play. So I, I thought it was smart the way they used that. And also, like, you know, if they give Vaemond Driftmark, then they could form an alliance with Vaemond, because Vaemond would owe them his lordship, so they would have the powerful Valarion fleet on their side. So, you know, it... It, it sort of largely goes unspoken, but it's a smart plot by the Hightowers to sort of steal the alliance of the Valerions from uh, Rhaenyra's side. And I thought it was interesting, like, Rhaenys' position through all of this. Um, because, you know, it was kind of crazy. It was kind of crazy when, when Rhaenyra and Daemon were talking. Like, 
Because remember last episode, Daemon and Rhaenyra faked uh, the death of Laenor Valerion. And Rhaenyra was saying, and Daemon was saying, that everyone's going to think that Rhaenyra and Daemon murdered Laenor Valerion so that Rhaenyra could marry Daemon. And we were wondering, like, will Rhaenys and Corlys think that Rhaenyra and Daemon murdered their son Laenor? Or are they going to, like, explain, like, hey, uh, we actually didn't murder your son, it's all cool. And apparently... Rhaenyra did not tell Rhaenys that she did not murder her son Laenor. Uh, she just now, like six years later, comes up to Rhaenys and says, uh, Hey, um, hey, you know how you think that I murdered your son? Yeah, no, I didn't. Like, why are you just saying that now, Rhaenyra? Um, and Rhaenys, you know, seems to think it's too little, too late. And Rhaenys does not welcome Rhaenyra's proposed alliance. Like, Rhaenyra says here, hey, like, Rhaenys, you should support me and my son Luke, and we should be pals, and we should marry Jace to Bela and marry Luke to Rhaena. But Rhaenys is like, no, fuck off. And, and I really liked the subtle thunder that was in the background. Like, there's a storm brewing, and we heard thunder uh, while Rhaenys was on screen a few times, which calls back to Rhaenys's Baratheon heritage, because... Rhaenys Targaryen is the daughter of Jocelyn Baratheon. Uh, and, you know, the Baratheons are associated with storms and Storm's End. So I thought that thunder was a really great way of sort of tying into Rhaenys' heritage and her sort of strength and her defiance and her family was really cool. But then Rhaenys changes her mind because later on um, in the throne room, Rhaenys unexpectedly says, you know what, I'm actually supporting uh, Luke and Rhaenyra, not Vaymond. Uh, which was nice. And yeah, like, Corlys is wounded, so we're hoping that he won't die. In the books, he's more just, like, sick because he's old. Corlys is quite quite old at this point in the books, but yeah, whatever. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Communist, who says, When the doom fell on Valyria, our house became the last of their kind. Yeah, we've got some more House Keltigar erasure, because, uh, yeah, so... The Valerians and the Targaryens are Valyrian. They came from the great Dragonlord Empire of Old Valyria. And when the Doom of Valyria blew them up, uh, the Targaryens and the Valerians survived because they had earlier come to Westeros. But they are not the only Valyrian families who escaped to Westeros. There was also a house called Keltigar. So crabs in the chat, folks, because the sigil of House Keltigar is a crab. And the Keltigars are cool. They've got like a Valyrian steel axe and everything. But uh, the the, Valer the Valerians and the Targaryens keep saying, no, we are the last Valyrian houses, ignoring the existence of the Keltigars. The, the showrunner Ryan Condal has acknowledged this. He said that uh, the Keltigars do exist in Hot D, it's just they're not very powerful, so no one cares. Uh, thanks, Vesexro, but no spoilers here. Interesting thought, though. Thanks for the super chat from Liam, who says he paid his penance for his wife's death. He battled the Stepstones for 20 years. He is Vizzy T, and he is my king from this day until my last day. I love how Viserys was not very competent, but he is very likable, and uh, I think that he did a wonderfully charismatic performance. Thanks for the super chat from Curl, who says, Viserys' face rot was on the side of the high towers at the table and on Alicent's bedside. Symbolism? Yeah, that, that's probably not a coincidence. Um, oh, this shot, by the way, is uh, straight out of one of the illustrations in Fire and Blood. Um, it was Alicent and Rhaenyra, Fire and Blood. There's a shot that looks... Yeah, there we go. There's an illustration by Doug Wheatley that looks um, just like this shot with Rhaenyra and Alicent, doesn't it? This was in some of the trailers. And there's even the pig in the illustration, actually, which is funny, because later they put a roast pig down in front of Amond. I wonder if that pig illustration is where they got the idea for the uh, pink dread being cooked up in front of Amond. That's fun. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Shade, who says, yeah, that's, that's something that's going to come up later. Thanks for the super chat from Christian, who says, do you think Viserys abdicating as his health declined in favor of Rhaenyra would have prevented the dance? That, it, it, I think that's a good idea, because, like, the issue is that no matter what Viserys says his wishes are, people may not follow his wishes after he dies. But if Viserys was actually around to say, hey, like, you know, I'm in poor health, 
I'm going to abdicate so that my heir Rhaenyra can take charge, you know, before I die. And he would have been able to actually oversee the transition and actually support Rhaenyra through the transition. I think that's a good idea. Although there's no uh, precedent for that in Targaryen history. Like, there is no Targaryen king who was king and then gave up being king in favor of someone else while they were still alive. Uh, at least to my memory. So, yeah, I, I think that's a decent idea, but it's not something that's been done before. So maybe that's why it can't happen. Thanks for the super chat from Non, who says, Why don't people name their kids Oris after Oris Baratheon, like they do with Aegon? Yeah, so Oris Baratheon was a buddy of Aegon the Conqueror when they... Uh, oh, no, no, was that a different... Yeah, no, Oris Baratheon. Uh, he did a cool duel against Argilac of uh, House Durandon, and uh, Oris Baratheon became the founder of House Baratheon when he defeated the Durandons alongside, during Aegon's conquest. Um, and Oris, Oris was cool. Why, why don't people name, name him Oris? I think part of the reason is that Oris was a bastard, uh, at least before he became the Baratheon. Uh, and there's a lot of questions about Oris's parentage. Like, some people think that Oris may have been Aegon's half-brother. And some people also suggest that... Some people theorize that Oris may have been the real father of Aegon's children. Like, some people theorize that Aegon the Conqueror was impotent. Um, there's also suggestions that, like, Rhaenys was fucking around. So, like, there's... It's so funny that, you know, all this fuss is made about Aegon's bloodline. And yet Aegon's bloodline may not have actually been Aegon's, depending on who you ask. And also this speaks to, you know, the, the connection between House Targaryen and House Baratheon, which is very old. Uh, Satali points out Jace with his Valyrian lessons we saw early in the episode. You'd think that they would all grow up bilingual. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how... I mean, I, I, do, do, do they need to be speaking High Valyrian all the time? Like, we see uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon talking Valyrian a lot, which is like their little sort of intimate conversational language. And you need Valyrian to command the dragons. Um, but, you know... I, I guess there's some old books that are probably written in High Valyrian. Like, Daemon was reading those books in Pentos. Maybe those are written in High Valyrian. So, yeah, I can see how it'd be useful, but not, like, super essential. What what I did like is it showed us that Jace is really uh, dutiful and determined to be, you know, he's earnest and he wants to do a good job, and so he's taking his studies seriously and he's trying to be a good guy. I think Jace is, is likable in that respect. Like, he's trying to be a good heir to the throne, and that contrasts with Alicent's son, Aegon, who is useless and fucking around and is insulting people. So I think Jace is uh, definitely a charismatic sort of a guy. Speaking, like, we were speaking in the previous episode about Helena's prophecy with, like, the dragons of flesh and the dragons of thread. Um, and there was a moment in this speech where Viserys took off his mask and he, like, showed his hideously uh, leprous face. And he's like, you know, look at me. Like I am just a man. Like I know that I'm a king and the gold and the crown, but beneath all that, I am just a human flesh and blood man. And I think that connects with the idea of dragons of flesh that Helena was talking about in the previous episode. Like the Targaryens are dragons. They are kings. They are conquerors. But beneath all of that, they are just humans. And that is what Viserys was appealing to. His vulnerability and his humanity. He's a dragon, but he's a dragon of flesh. So I, I really enjoyed that. Thanks for the super chat from Lord Crow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is one of the better episodes, sure. Thanks for the super chat from James, who says, Can we talk about how Amon's aged like 10 more years than his siblings? Yeah, Amon, Amon's, Amon's sure, looking, uh, sure looking older. I loved his first line. Like, he's, uh, he's sparring with Kristen Cole. The books mention how uh, Amon has become a very powerful warrior under the tutelage of Kristen Cole. Because Kristen Cole is this very powerful warrior and he's taught Amond everything he knows. Um, and and that's despite the lack of his eye. I think it's pretty ballsy to be facing off against Kristen Cole's Morning Star when you've got no depth perception. Like, is it just me or would that be incredibly difficult? You can't see in 3D when you've only got one eye. Trust me, I know. Um, so I'm, I'm shocked that Amond didn't take a Morning Star to the face. Um, but yeah, Amond is a really powerful warrior. And then his first line, or one of his first lines, 
Kristen says, oh, you'll be winning tourneys in no time, Amond. And then Amond says, I don't give a shit about tourneys. Which I thought was such a great line because it shows that he is like no nonsense. He doesn't care about like the the frivolous activity of, of a tourney. What he cares about is like real fights, real violence, real killing, real real getting shit done. I think that one line tells us a lot about Amond. And then he immediately turns to his nephews and says, ah, you here to train? And so I think that's, you know very much highlighting his rivalry and his hatred of Luke who took his eye um so you get the sense that that's what he's training for you know my god thanks for the super chat from Misting who says how long has it been since the last winter in this timeline that's a good question I I don't know off the top of my head you could figure it out by looking at the book um that's a good question, because of course in this world the seasons are irregular, sometimes the winters go for years, sometimes the summers go for years, and uh, especially in the north that's a really big deal, people starve when it's winter in the north, and that affects, you know, armies marching as well, like mobility is less during uh, during winter, so yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head. Thanks for the super chat from Brad, who says, When Daemon helped his brother up the throne, it really drove home that he does love his family. Yeah, I, I agree that was lovely. Um, Daemon does, especially his brother, love his family very much. Doesn't mean that Daemon's decisions are good for the family all of the time, but Daemon, it, it, Daemon is definitely motivated by, um, by love for his family. I mean, he didn't love uh, Lena all that much. His, his relationship with Lena was uh, difficult. His wife, Lena. Uh, th- there was apparently, uh, according to rumor, there was a cut scene or a cut moment where Daemon was uh, flirting with some man, some serving man in Pentos at Reggio's feast. Like, there is a moment in the episode where Daemon sort of, like, touches the arm and, and whispers a few words to this serving man, uh, which, with the implication being that he's, like, cheating on, uh, cheating on Lena and is a hashtag bisexual king, uh, which didn't, there might have been some further stuff there that was cut from the episode, but um, yeah, anyway. Thanks for the super chat from Christopher, who says, Does the whole ending scene with Alicent and Viserys prove that the whole prince that was promised is just a wishy-washy dream, reflecting Jon's lackluster conclusion in season 8? Yeah, so I- I've said before that I think it's interesting that they are emphasizing the prophecy so much, uh, given that the prophecy in the Game of Thrones show didn't really go anywhere. In the books, there is reason to believe that, like, you know, Jon Snow and or Daenerys and or others, you know, the Danes, you know, that it, it, it seems like in the books the prophecy really will go somewhere. Um, Jon might, you know, wield a flaming sword and sacrifice Daenerys and defeat the White Walkers. But in the Game of Thrones show, Arya jumped out of a tree and and sporked the Night King with, with a bit of cutlery, with the Valyrian steel cat's paw blade. Um, so you definitely can question, like, is the prophecy just wishful thinking or is the prophecy something real? And that is something that the books play with. Um, I I do think it's interesting that, that Viserys in this episode says that Rhaenyra is the one. Rhaenyra is the, the prince that was promised. Um... Which reminds me of when Maester Aemon in the books. There's a book. There's a moment when Aemon says that Rain that that Daenerys is the prince that was promised. He says like, oh, you know, it, we were looking for a prince, but it's actually a princess. And in the show, they say that like prince and princess uh, is not a gendered word in Valyrian, Valyrian, so it could mean either one. And so you know, Aemon sort of on his deathbed is like, oh my god, it's not a prince, it's a princess. It, it's Daenerys is the prince that was promised. And now Viserys is going, oh, it's Rhaenyra that's the prince that was promised, which is you know that like that's not that's. It's not in the books, but it makes sense because it seems that every generation of Targaryens thinks that they are the fulfillment of the prince that was promised prophecy, like, you know, Rhaegar and and possibly like like Aerys the First and Jaehaerys the Second. They all had their various beliefs about the prophecy. Um and uh so it makes sense that Viserys has his own and so, you know, I don't think they I don't think they're all gonna be correct about their interpretation of the prophecy. Um but is it 
I, I am very curious about what else they're going to reveal about the prophecy in this show because they've made it so central and it is weird for them to make it so central if the bottom line is they were wrong it, Arya Stark is going to do it and the Targaryens were like part of the battle of the Long Night but not central to it so did the Targaryens really need to be on the throne eh like I, I think it would be unsatisfying if that is where the prophecy goes so I do hope that there are some kind of revelation but you know it yeah I, th I think tying things into Game of Thrones season 8 is just not all that satisfying Thanks for the super chat from Toolsy, who says that Viserys said in an early episode, what if I was wrong? I saw Aegon wearing the Conqueror's crown, and now Viserys says Aegon is the one. So honestly, Alicent thinks it's his wish to an extent. Yeah, a a Alicent's interpretation of this conversation is that is that Alicent's son, Aegon, is the prince that was promised and should be the rightful heir. I mean, Alicent doesn't know what the prince that was promised is. She doesn't know what Viserys is talking about here, but she thinks that he's saying that her son Aegon is the one and needs to be on the throne. But I think that's kind of Alicent believing what she wants to believe there. I think she's sort of choosing to believe uh, that he's talking about Aegon, which kind of makes Alicent the villain here, because Alicent really was genuinely for a moment trying to reconcile with Rhaenyra. And like she was saying, like Alicent and Rhaenyra were as close as they had been in ages. They're saying, hey, let's be pals again or let's let's just start to not hate each other so much again like we would we would like to become closer it's this beautiful moment but just afterwards i, I think that alison's ambition is rekindled by viserys and all of a sudden she's like oh i would actually like my son to be on the throne despite my supposed support of rhaenyra earlier like alison says at this dinner uh yeah rhaenyra you're gonna be a great queen so it seems like she's letting go of her ambition and actually supporting peace and Rhaenyra, but then at the end she's like, oh, my son Aegon on the throne, you know? It didn't take much. It didn't take much for her to uh, go right back on to the ambition train. Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from TJ, who says, Mazaria's spy Talia looks awfully familiar. Uncanny resemblance to some previous well-known characters. So we did have an interesting revelation uh, that Mazaria, the White Worm, is back, uh, and she's continuing to be a spy master. And this woman, Talia, who is a handmaiden, uh, she is working for Mazaria and informing Mazaria of what's going on in the Red Keep. And I wonder, like, is Mazaria continuing to feed information to Otto Hightower, like when she told Otto about Daemon hooking up with Rhaenyra? Or is she her own agent now? It's been a lot of years. What exactly is Mazaria up to? And I wonder what is Mazaria's relationship to Daemon? Are they still together or not anymore? What is Mazaria's game? Be interesting to find out. I think she may still have resentment against Daemon for uh, Daemon fucking her around on Dragonstone and saying that he's going to marry her and then not marrying her and putting her in danger and all of that. Uh, Philip in the live chat suggests that uh, Mazaria might be working with Laris. Yeah, I think that's a good theory because, you know, Laris knows things about, uh, you know, Moon Tea and the Red Keep and so on. So maybe Mazaria is Laris's source of information. I think that makes sense. Uh, some people in the live chat are saying that Talia looks like Melisandre. Does she look like Melisandre? Should, should we... I mean, she's, she does have, like, reddish hair in that light, I suppose. I, I, I guess there's some resemblance there. Does she look like... I think they all look pretty similar when they're in these uh, candlelit, candlelit rooms. Everyone looks a little bit red. Everyone's a red woman in candlelight. I guess there is some similarity there, yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Philippe, who says, Thoughts on Aegon's characterization so far? think they made him too much of a villain with the maid situation yeah Aegon's not a good guy I mean Aegon's Aegon's knocking up the maid it was was bad uh and it also was bad when Aegon was insulting um insulting Jace at table and like propositioning his betrothed at table while everyone else is trying to make peace he is 
blind or or opposed to the peacemaking that is going on and he's like actively uh insulting jace and baylor which is a dick move um I think that sort of the the context here is that you know Aegon's relationship with Alicent is so toxic. Like we've seen Alicent hit Aegon twice now, um, and Aegon keeps saying, "Oh, I, like I'm doing my best. I didn't ask to be the to be the the arrival claimant to the throne. I didn't want any of this." And his mother just keeps hitting him. So I think you know there is some pain. In Aegon, we see him cry, and, you know, the way that he expresses that pain is to uh, insult and bully others and to knock up serving girls. So, yeah, he's a horrible person. Um, But I think that it is important that they showed us his vulnerability at the same time as showing us his dickishness. And I think, you know, it's fairly consistent with the way he's described in the books. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the characterization of Aegon, and I'm excited to see what comes next. Um, thanks for the super chat from Pat, who says that server girl really got the inside scoop on everything happening inside the castle. I'm guessing Otto is not aware of this spy. Yeah, I mean, Talia, Talia is like Alicent's serving girl primarily, I think. So I wonder if Alicent has any knowledge of Talia. Like, if it is that... Talia and Mazaria are informing Laris, and Laris is supporting Alicent. I wonder if Alicent might know that Talia is a spy. But I mean, if Alicent knows that Talia is a spy, why wouldn't Talia just tell Alicent things directly instead of Talia telling Mazaria, telling Laris, telling Alicent? I, I think that Talia and Mazaria might be uh, up to their own game. Thanks for the super chat from Devon, who says, Do you think Lenor will return? Yeah, so we don't want to spoil anything, but I I mean, it is a change from the books that Lenor is... It is a change from the books. Um, I, I do think the issue of Sea Smoke is important, because Sea Smoke is the dragon of Lenor, and... As far as we know, a dragon cannot have a new rider while the old rider is still alive. As long as Lenor is alive, Sea Smoke theoretically should not be able to take any more riders. And also theoretically, there are hints that dragons might be able to sense or, or find their rider. There's like a psychic bond there. So I wonder like, is Sea Smoke gonna go out and try and find Lenor? I think that I think that would make sense. So, you know, I mean I it, it would be interesting to me if they addressed that. Like, what if the Dragon Keepers said, oh, like, Sea Smoke is acting weird. Sea Smoke seems upset about Lenor's death, or like, or like, I don't know, what if they had a funeral for Lenor, and then Sea Smoke was at the funeral and, like, smelling the corpse and going, that's not Lenor. I don't know, like, I, I would like to see a little bit more from Sea Smoke, but, I mean, you know, that is, Sea Smoke is one dragon among many, so I'm not sure if we'll, um, I'm not sure if we'll get any more from him there but yeah there's certain there's some possibilities with Lenor so I'm interested to see I'm interested to see what happens uh thanks for the super chat from Caro who says that Amond aged way faster yeah look the time skips and the ages don't always make sense because it's impossible to cast the actors at like exactly the right ages at exactly the right years you, we do have to suspend our disbelief a little bit I think thanks for the super chat from Gunnar who says the lack of dragons in this episode is weird I, I mean, the dragons are expensive with the CGI, so I, I think it's permissible to not have too much dragon action all the time. But uh, I expect we'll see more of the dragons later. Thanks for the super chat from Watt, who says, The pig being carried in as the king is being carried off is wonderful symbolism for how the instant Viserys leaves, the family that he so dearly loves will begin carving themselves and the realm up. Yeah, that's a great point, Watt. I agree. Because... Uh, You know, Viserys talked before about, like, I will not have these crows feasting on the corpse of my dead family. Um, And, yeah, just as Viserys is carried off, the pig is carried in. And so that almost represents Viserys' corpse and everyone dining on Viserys' corpse trying to get their piece of power. I mean, you know, the, the, the vultures were descending even before Viserys was dead, like what with Vaymond trying to secure his uh, claim of a driftmark and so on. So, 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. It's very much the vultures descending on Viserys's corpse. Thanks for the super chat from Dongle, who says, I was digging the energy between Daemon and Amond. They're both wild cards. I'm excited to see how they might interact. Yeah, Daemon and Amon stared each other down wonderfully. I mean, they are. I mean, they've got to be the two greatest warriors in this in this story currently, right? Like, Daemon is is a renowned fighter, and Amon is said to be very powerful. Um, what with his training by by Kristen. I mean, Kristen is also a very great fighter. Um, Aegon is is not noted as a great warrior. Uh, Jace and Lucerus, I mean, you know, we'll see. We might see more a little bit later. I mean, there's the Kingsguard, I suppose. Like, you know, Harold Westerling, his his strength as a warrior is not described in the books, but he's probably good. We we did get to meet Arik and Eric, these new Kingsguard, this episode, actually. Um, and they are identical twins, Arik and Eric, and uh, they are going to be relevant later on. Yeah, we got this moment here where Alicent said, ah, oh, you know, hi, Arik. And then he said, no, I'm not Arik, I'm Eric. Uh, it's funny that, like, we've got Arik and Eric being interchangeable. Like, Alison got confused about Arik and Eric, and then at the end of the episode, Alison got confused about Aegon and Aegon when Viserys was talking about Aegon the Conqueror, and she thought he was talking about Aegon, her son. So we've got Aegon and Aegon, we've got Arik and Eric, we've got Baylor and Rainer and Laenor and Laenor, and we've got Rhaenys and Rhaenyra and Daemon and, and, and fucking... There's, there's so many similar names. There, there was a thing in... Um, the interviews where the co-creators of this show or the, or the co-showrunners of this show Ryan and Miguel were talking about hey like there are so many characters with the same name or similar names in this show we've got to change the names of some of these characters so it's not too confusing uh, but the co-showrunner Ryan Condal said absolutely not we are not changing any names we are staying faithful to the books and uh, you know you know honestly I would not blame them if they decided to change some names like, I've seen online people, like, misspelling and getting confused about who's who. Uh, I would not blame them changing some names. It's like when they changed um, uh, uh, Asher Greyjoy in the books is named Yara Greyjoy in the TV show uh, because they didn't want Asher getting confused with Osher, who is the wildling. Like, I, I think it's reasonable to change some of those names. I mean, they, they say when you write a book you should never have two characters with the same letter at the start of their name. Um, you shouldn't have John and Josh because that would be too confusing. But I mean, George has filled up the whole alphabet 10 times over. So, you know, he's breaking every rule. Thanks for the super chat from Lee, who says, what's up with Lady Misery? I mean, we, we sort of talked about her, but I, I, it, it seems that she's continuing to be a spy master and she's being informed by Talia, who's one of the servants in the Red Keep. And we don't know who Mazaria is working with. Is she still informing Otto? Is she maybe working with Laris? Is she maybe working with Alicent? Is she a free agent? Is she trying to get revenge on Daemon? Is she just trying to make herself wealthy? I, I like how, you know, her earrings and her clothes sort of subtly suggest that, you know, she's doing well for herself. Like, she's made some money. She's doing well. Um, she could be anywhere if she wanted to, I think. I think she's in King's Landing because she wants to be in King's Landing. So what is her plan there? Thanks for the super chat from Vi. We already talked about the prince that was promised. Um, I, 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 maybe the prince that was promised is uh, Ned Stark because he fathered Arya, who is Lightbringer. I don't know. Thanks for the super chat from Eric, or is it Eric, who says, I'm Team Blacks. How about you? Tell me in the chat whether you support Rhaenyra and her family, who are called the Blacks in the books, or do you support Alicent and her family, who are called the Greens? I have I have a suspicion that it's going to be more the... Oh, we can do a poll, can't we? Um, Blacks, Rhaenyra's family, or Greens, Alicent's family. We're going to put a poll in the live chat right now, and it is... Uh, who you support, question mark, and uh, ask your community, and it, it's live now. You can vote in the live chat, do you support Alicent or Rhaenyra? There's a poll, and then I'll tell you what the results are shortly. Thanks for the super chat from Rational, 
who says King Viserys' last day in court was so moving, with his black sheep brother putting the crown on his head, no less. I'm not crying, you're crying. Yeah, I, I thought Viserys' last walk was really wonderful when he was, you know, obviously in so much pain and discomfort doing that, taking power, so much like risk to himself, but he was so determined to do the right thing. And, you know, like, he's kind of dumb because it's like, well, you could have, you should have done this earlier, you know? Like, Viserys should have asserted himself more. And, you know, it's understandable he was very sick and he sort of allowed Alicent and Otto to do everything for him. He wasn't really able to, to take power, but, you know, and the milk of the poppy addling his mind and... But, all, you know, I, lo I love how he had the moment of taking off his mask, showing his vulnerability, um, and just being a human being and a dad and a husband and a father who just reluctantly played the role of a king. He didn't want to be a king. He wasn't good at being a king. This was thrust upon him. And that shows, you know, what a bad system the monarchy is. I mean, it's the same with Aegon. It's the same with bloody Aegon saying, I didn't ask for this. I'm not a good king. I never wanted to be a king. Monarchy puts people in charge who have no qualifications or no business being in charge. So it's not surprising that um, sometimes you get bad results. Uh, we have 4,000 people have voted in this poll for the Blacks or the Greens. And 87% of voters support Rhaenyra and her family, not Alicent and her family. We should do this every episode to see if the these poll number changes. 4,000 people have voted, and 87% support Rhaenyra over Alicent. And I think that's not shocking, given that Viserys the King has so clearly sort of put his support behind Rhaenyra. I mean, you know, not always clearly, but he has always supported Rhaenyra. And Alicent's, Alicent's moment at the end of the episode saying, oh, you want my son Aegon to be king? That, that is so much her hearing what she wants to hear. That is so much her, you know, twisting Viserys' words. That's not what Viserys meant. I think Alicent does have, you know, legitimate reason to feel angry at Rhaenyra. Because Rhaenyra... I, I mean, fundamentally, Alicent is correct that Rhaenyra's children are bastards. And Rhaenyra is a liar. And Rhaenyra is a rule breaker. And Alicent is a religious person who believes that Rhaenyra has sinned grievously. Um, and there's the fact that a lot of the kingdom won't support a female ruler, don't, doesn't, don't want a female ruler. Like, that, that is still at issue here, and so just by fact of being female, Rhaenyra being the ruler will be destabilizing and a bit risky compared to a male being on the throne. And it's not Rhaenyra's fault, of course, that, you know, this is a patriarchal world, uh, but it's a fact. And so, you know, I, I think there are arguments in support of Alicent's side. But uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree with the audience that Rhaenyra is more is more sympathetic at this point. Thanks for the super chat from Fak, who says, "How do you think Corlys will react coming home to find his brother dead?" I mean, Corlys and Vaymont did not always get along, um, and if Corlys knew that Vaymont was trying to steal Driftmark from Corlys's chosen heir, Luke. Eh, I don't know if Corlys is going to be weeping too many tears for Vaymond. Um, I mean, you know, he's he's an honourable guy, and Vaymond is his brother, so he's not going to be happy that Vaymond was killed dishonourably. I mean, it's also interesting that, you know, Daemon is the one who killed Vaymond, and it was kind of murder, because, like, Viserys did not tell anyone to kill Vaymond. Viserys told... Viserys wanted Vaemon's tongue cut out, but then Daemon just killed him on the spot. Which, I mean, that, that's murder. That wasn't what the king asked for. Um, I don't think anyone's gonna, gonna take Daemon to court for that particular murder, but, I mean, you know, my point is that since Corlys and Daemon are allies, or at least former allies and friends, uh, Corlys might be angry at Daemon for killing his brother in cold blood. Um, and, you know, especially considering the fact that Corlys and Rhaenys still apparently think up until this episode, that Rhaenyra and Daemon murdered their son, Laenor, in the previous episode, maybe Corlys is going to be pissed. Maybe Corlys will consider Daemon his enemy now. I think there's a few ways that um, he might take it. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that the Valerion relationship is uh, certainly complicated now by recent events. Thanks for the super chat from Greg, who says, Are Baylor and Rayna not twins in the show? The Rayna actresses 
at both ages seem younger than the Baylor actresses. Um, I I think they're twins. Uh, they haven't said anything otherwise. Um, so you reckon that Raina looks younger? Yeah, I guess I would agree with that. I mean, Raina is meant to be younger by about five seconds. It is. I mean, that's one of the other fun things about the the ridiculousness of the monarchy. Um, that literally being the twin who comes out of the womb first can determine whether you inherit a lordship or a throne or whether you inherit next to nothing. Um, so the whole twin thing is something that they play with, with, you know, like Cersei and, and Jamie and with Arik and Eric. So, you know, twinhood is, is going to be a thing. But yeah, Baylor is the elder twin. So she is the one who is um, potentially going to... Well, was potentially going to inherit Driftmark, but now the plan is that Jace is going to marry Baylor and Luke is going to marry Raina. And, you know, that is a way of, like, binding up the disagreements, the, uh, you know, the slight murder kerfuffle between House Valerion and Targaryen and to bind together these families again, which, which, is, a, which is a different situation to how it worked in the books. In the books, there was this wonderful friendship between... Rhaenyra and Daemon and Lena and Baylor and Rhaena, because when Daemon and Lena were married, they hung out on Driftmark for a while, and Rhaenyra was on Dragonstone. So they were like neighbors, and like their, their families hung out together, and low key, like Daemon and Rhaenyra might have been fucking around on the side. But, you know, there was this friendship between Rhaenyra's family and um, Daemon and. And, you know, Lena, like, they're all friends together, and that's part of what led to this betrothal that happens between Rhaenyra's kids and Daemon's kids. Um, and there's also slight hints that Lena and Rhaenyra may even have been, like, romantically involved, maybe, because Rhaenyra was, quote, fond and more than fond of Lena. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to ship... If you want to ship anyone with anyone, you can in the books, because there's a lot of sort of ambiguous romantic relationships. Thanks for the super chat from Bifong, who says, They've done an awesome job showing the tragedy with Viserys, trying to make everyone happy, but seeing everything slowly fall apart in front of him. Even Viserys' body parts are literally falling apart in front of him. Yeah, the, it's, it's tragic. I think the part that I found the most sad was when Rhaenyra walked into uh, Viserys' bedroom and saw his uh, model city, his, his Valyria city, which is like his pride and joy, his little Warhammer hobby, hobby his model train set. And Viserys, you know, this was Viserys' passion. And then when Rhaenyra comes home and like visits uh, Viserys and sees her father for the first time in a long time, she sees cobwebs and she sees a rat and she sees like the dilapidation that that her father's pride and joy has fallen into, which is it just feels so sad because that's just such a mark of how far Viserys has fallen. Um, you know, if you've ever had a loved one who has given up on their hobby and given up on the thing that gives them joy, I think that's such a painful sign of someone being unwell. And I think that's what Rhaenyra is observing in her own father as he's getting older. So I, th I thought that was a really poignant, sad moment. And, you know, it also ties into the symbolism of, of Valyria itself, which was this empire that was so powerful and so full of dragons, and then it fell calamitously. And I think that the cobwebs and the mice, you know, on the model of Valyria suggests the inevitable fall of all empires and the downfall that may one day come to house targaryen because of course we know that you know by the time of the game of thrones show uh there are no more dragons anymore and there are very few targaryens left anymore so you know something happened to to cause a decline in house targaryen so uh, maybe that we witness some of that uh we'll close the poll now 87 percent of you voted for rhaenyra as opposed to alicent We'll, we'll, we'll do that poll again another time and see if the numbers change. Thanks for the super chat from Lucas, who says, Do you think Alicent's deference to Rhaenyra was legitimate? Was she being honest in accepting her as Viserys' heir, or was she just playing along to make corpse, hu corpse hubby happy? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you could speculate that Alicent was being duplic- duplicitous and was just pretending to be friendly to Rhaenyra. But I tend to think that in the moment, Alicent was being sincere. I, I think Alicent really did want to make peace because, like, because... I think what was so wonderful and tragic about this dinner scene is that the adults were, were moved by Viserys's words and by Viserys's ill health. I think the adults, being a bit more mature and being a bit more grown up, they they and being more emotionally connected to Viserys, like it really does move them to see Viserys dying, and that really does inspire Alicent and Rhaenyra to try to make peace, to try and make things better. Um, I think that the adults have a better sense of their own mortality and not wanting to risk what they have. Like, like Alicent and Rhaenyra, they are mothers. They have children now. Even Daemon has children now. Maybe he has even mellowed out. So, like, the, Rhaenyra and Alicent have so much more to lose now. Like, they are not just feuding teenagers anymore. They are a bit more grown up. And so I, I think that Alicent and Rhaenyra are sincere to a large extent in trying to make peace and support each other. But the kids... You know, Jace and Luke and Amond, they are not grown up. They do not have as much to lose. They have no sense of their own mortality. All they have is fucking testosterone. And, uh, you know, what, what was Rhaenys' line in episode one? Fists full of steel and balls full of seed. I think Amond has the steel and Amon and Aegon has the seed in this case. But it was the kids who continued the inertia of the conflict whilst the adults were trying to make peace because the kids are not grown up, the kids are not mature, the kids are not moved by Aegon's, by Viserys's vulnerability. So, yeah, I thought it was really great the way that that feast scene went down. Uh, Sid says, where Viserys's eye? Do you think it just fell out one day, like rolled under the bed? Maybe you could just fetch it and, and pop it back in. Maybe maybe Amond wants... Viserys's eye to replace the eye that he lost. Maybe Amond took Viserys's eye. Uh, you know, and of course, I, I think that you know the the bandage that was over Viserys's missing eye. You know, that implies blindness. You know, Viserys is not fully aware of what's going on around him, so his lost eye definitely speaks to that. I think. Thanks for the super chat from No No, who says Aegon ordered that the trees should be killed, felled, burn them all. I bet the weirwood in the garden is a planted spy. The three-eyed raven, his weirwood, are the true enemy. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So, uh, so you know, trees are the trees have eyes. Literally, they've got they've got faces, and the old gods can see through the weirwoods. The green seers can see through the weirwoods. Uh, Blood raven has not been born yet, but the green seers can see through time to some extent. So it is entirely plausible that Blood raven, the three-eyed raven, and Bran could be watching these events from the Weirwood. I, it would not shock me if they actually did some subtle nod to Bloodraven or Bran in this show somehow through the Weirwood at some point. But yeah, like, you know, this Weirwood tree um, does not exist in the main Game of Thrones show, so someone must have cut down this tree at some point. Uh, we actually do see a Weirwood stump in Game of Thrones Season 3, Episode 4, that Sansa is praying to. It doesn't look like the same exact location, but, you know, this is what remains, perhaps, of uh, this weirwood tree in Hot D. So, you know, maybe when Jace was talking about trees being felled, I mean, I, I think in that case, Aegon the Conqueror was talking about, like, um, felling the trees around the Blackwater Rush uh, so that um, King's Landing could be built, because Aegon just, like, landed... Uh, on Blackwater Bay and then was like, hey, let's let's build a city here. Um, and that meant cutting down a bunch of trees. So, like, you know, I, I don't think that that line was referring to weirwood trees specifically. But, um, yeah, it does make us wonder about the weirwoods. Thanks for the super chat from Talia, who says, Jace and Helena dancing, showing us what could have been at their wedding feast. Yeah, it's a great point, Talia, because... Uh, Rhaenyra proposed marriage between Helena and Jace and it's it's really lovely to see them getting along um, and dancing and having a good time here it's like well if Jace and Helena did marry if Alicent did accept that proposition then maybe these families could have been united and this could have been a beautiful relationship but I don't know if Jace is being entirely pure in his dance with Helena here because Jace was being taunted by Aegon 
who was insulting Jace and his betrothal to Baylor. So I think that Jace may have been dancing with Helena as a way to aggravate Aegon. Like, you know, you insulted my betrothed, so I'm going to, you know, like, like Aegon, Aegon was like mocking and like propositioning sex with Jace's betrothed Baylor. So I think that Jace was like, well, if you're going to like hit on my betrothed, I'm going to hit on your wife by dancing with Helena. So I don't know if that was all pure, but the dancing was uh, the dancing was very cute, and it's nice to see Helena behaving like a like a person and having fun. So all of that was all of that was good. Uh, thanks for the donation from Gotham, who says whenever Amond and Daemon grin, uh, they grin when the other is doing something chaotic. They have a mutual respect for each other. I think respect might be a bit of a of a generous use of the word between Daemon and Amond. Um, but I think they certainly understand each other. I think there certainly is some similarity between Daemon and Amond. They both have some extremely large chips on their shoulder, and they both exercise violence as a way of dealing with their feelings. So, um, maybe they'll be friends. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Ataku, who says, The beasts beneath the boards are Laris's rats. Are rats beasts? I feel like rats are too small to be beasts, but uh, there's a few fun different ways to interpret Helena's comments about the beast beneath the boards. Thanks, Devon and Presta, who says the Arik and Eric thing is funny. I worked with an Australian guy and people named Aaron and Aaron. They sound the same in my accent, not his. Yeah, I like the different pronunciations of uh, Aegon or Egon. Some people say Egon. I thought it was ridiculous the pronunciations of Jeharis. Um, like Viserys and Paddy Considine in Hot D keep saying Jehiris instead of Jeharis, I think. Jeharis, Jehiris, Jeharis, Jeharis, Jeharis. There's a lot of weird ways that people say that name. Uh, I mean, just for the record, um, George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, he doesn't say Dothraki. He says Dothraki. Dothraki. To me, that seems ridiculous, but he's the author, so how can we argue? Uh, thanks for the super chat from Jaden, who says, Was Viserys talking about Jon Snow in the prophecy of the prince that was promised, seeing as Aegon is Jon's real name? I think that Viserys was talking about Aegon the Conqueror and, like, Aegon's dream, because he said that Rhaenyra is the prince that was promised, not not Aegon. You are the one. You must do this, Viserys said, thinking that he was talking to Rhaenyra. It is you. So I think that that Viserys was saying that that Rhaenyra is the is the prince that was promised, and when Aegon when Viserys said Aegon, he was referring to Aegon the Conqueror who like made the prophecy. So I yeah I don't think that Viserys is talking about Jon Snow here, uh, but yeah I mean theoretically Jon Snow may be the prince that was promised ultimately in some sense at least. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Silver, who says, Viserys tried to paper over the powder keg he created. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable um, description of what Viserys does. Because, like, at the last minute, he tries to make peace, he tries to fix everything. But that doesn't undo the decades of his failure to lay down the law and to make peace and to make some you know, more clear binding statements. I mean, like, remember in episode one when Viserys held that whole ceremony with Rhaenyra and he got all of those lords to swear loyalty to Rhaenyra? Like, that's what's needed. If, if, if Viserys is serious about Rhaenyra taking the throne, he needs to do that again. I mean, he shouldn't have to do it twice, but... You know, he, sh he should have a big ceremony and he should say, I want, you know, because some of the lords who were here, like all those years ago, who came and swore to Rhaenyra, some of those lords are dead now. So what Viserys should do is have another big ceremony and get all of the sons and all of the current lords and all of their heirs and bring them to King's Landing and say, hey, Rhaenyra is my chosen heir and her children, Jace and Luke, are the, are the heirs after her, like Jace is next on the throne. Luke is going to take over Driftmark. They are legitimate. Maybe he should even legitimize them. Like, I, this is what Viserys should do in order to try and create some peace and stability behind Rhaenyra. And I, I think that his little Thanksgiving dinner uh, is, is not enough. So yeah, I, I agree with you, Silverscale. He should have done more. Thanks for the super chat from Sam, who says, Alicent going back to war mode 
seemed like an easy way out, writing-wise. Viserys coming in to save the day. I'm gonna miss him. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens next episode. Because Alicent, you know, Alicent hasn't done anything yet. Like, we've seen her with Viserys. We've seen her interpret Viserys' words as being supportive of Aegon. But I think there's still a lot more to happen. Um, I think there's a lot of reasoning that's gonna go behind Alicent's decisions. And remember, like, Alicent is very much influenced by Otto, and influenced by Laris, and influenced by Kristen. So I think that all of that is going to be relevant for Alicent going forward. And I, I do like that we had this moment of attempted reconciliation between Alicent and Rhaenyra, which um, I sure hope won't seem tragic in hindsight. Thanks for the super chat from Abe, who says, Most of this episode felt like pure exposition. A lot of telling, not a lot of showing. I thought that the feast was a lot of showing. Like, we really saw some of these characters' opinions change in real time, you know? Like, Alicent and Rhaenyra's feelings towards each other and towards Viserys. Um, and, you know, the, the Vaymond confrontation was very much happening before our eyes as Vaymond felt pushed to the point of having to, you know, say the bastardy. I, I think there is always, like, some feeling of exposition with the time skip episodes because, like, inevitably they have to explain to us what happened in the meantime. So, like, when, you know, Rhaenys was saying, you know, no, I'm not going to support you, Rhaenyra, because I think that you murdered my son, Lainor. There has to be a bit of exposition there. Um, but I enjoyed it. Like, th this was a relatively, like, action-light episode. It was really just entirely conversations. There were no, you know, dragons or fights or battles or anything. No sex scenes either. There were no tits or dragons. Um, but... I, uh, I think it was one of the more effective episodes, personally. Thanks for the super chat from Heather, who says, I hate the greens and I love the blacks. At least Rhaenyra is somewhat reasonable. The greens are always awful. I mean, they certainly are, uh, more, more, uh, there's more dickheads <laughs> with the greens. Like, Aegon is a dickhead with his insults and his knocking up the serving girl. Aemond is a violent provocateur trying to destabilize the kingdom, trying to get revenge against Luke. Uh, Helena is uh, harmless. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, Jace and Luke certainly are more likable and heroic than Amond and Aegon. So yeah, I think there's a lot of good reasons to support the Blacks. But again, like, the Blacks are lying. Uh, Rhaenyra is lying about Jace and Luke, their parentage. Like, Alicent is correct that they are bastards. So that is relevant too. Thanks for the super chat from Brian, who says that Viserys' mask was like the Phantom of the Opera mask. Thanks for the super chat from Jessica, who says this episode makes Alicent less sympathetic and a hypocrite with covering up the rape of the serving girl by Aegon and use of the moon tea. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot going on with with Alicent, you know, enforcing uh, the the sort of patriarchal rules of you know women. Uh, being used by men sexually, and then Alicent, you know, covers up the secret of her son, Prince Aegon, uh, fucking around. Um, whereas with Rhaenyra's infidelity, a Alicent was all, you must be honest and you must tell the truth and, you know, you must be held accountable for your sins. Whereas with her own son, Aegon, she is complicit in covering it up, you know? And she just sort of accepts the status quo. I mean, she's angry that Aegon is sleeping around and whatever, but... Yeah. Al Alicent is, has become part of the system and an, an enforcer of the system that covers up uh, the crimes that she was so angry at Rhaenyra for, for perpetrating. Thanks for the super chat from All Your Base, who says, Did Vaymond have any kids? That is a good question that may be relevant later. Like, Vaymond has been beheaded, or at least the top half of his head was removed. Um, so, you know, he's dead, but maybe Vaymond will have some family of his own who might have opinions about who should get Driftmark. So, yeah, we should not assume that this Valerion succession crisis is over, necessarily. It might be uh, just beginning. Thanks for the super chat from Gotham. Who's, and I'll note that in the books, Vaymond is Corliss's cousin, not his brother. So they made it a bit more personal and a bit more intimate between Vaymond and Corliss in the show. 
Uh, we answered that. Thanks for the super chat from Ty Lisa, who says, Why was Rainies glued to Vaymon's body being prepared? Thanks for the chat. I enjoy your videos. Yeah, that's a good question. That They did spend a lot of time with Rainies watching Vaymon's corpse, or the, the two pieces of... <laughs> of uh, Vaymond's corpse. I mean, Vaymond is her brother-in-law. Vaymond is the brother of her husband, Corliss. And I think Va I think Rhaenys is thinking... She may be thinking about, like, legacy. Like, her husband, Corliss, is obsessed with legacy and obsessed with his name and obsessed with, you know, Luke Valerion being the next Lord of Driftmark. And I think Rhaenys is sort of contemplating... Uh, I mean, you know, she has said over and over, hey, Corliss, your ambitions are going to get our family killed. Um, and, you know, she's worried about her own kids. But now Vaymond has been killed as a result of these clashes and stuff. And so I think, you know, something that comes up a lot in A Song of Ice and Fire is that the, the men keep on, you know, f doing these fights and getting people killed. And the women are dragged along with it. We saw that with Emma dragged along with Viserys' ambitions. And we saw Alicent dragged along with Otto's ambitions. And, and Rhaenys is dragged along with Corlys' ambitions. And she sees the cost of that. And I, I'm not sure that Corlys does but maybe Corliss's mind will change when he sees Vaymond, the various pieces of Vaymond. CC in the live chat says that Rhaenys thinks it's an omen. Holland says that Rhaenys is numb to death. Yeah, yeah, because Rhaenys has lost her son, Lainor. She's lost her son, her daughter, Lena. She has suffered so much, and, and here's just more bodies piling up, you know? So how is she going to react to that? Is she going to become, like more protective and more afraid? Or is she going to become more YOLO and more violent, you know? I mean, she threw in her lot with Rhaenyra in this episode. Like, at first she was against Rhaenyra, but then she's like, fuck it. Like, I support Luke and Jace marrying Baylor and Raina. Like, we're on the side of Rhaenyra. So, you know, I wonder what her reasoning is there. Like, is she no longer afraid of all this death? Has she already lost so much that she is not even afraid of losing more? I really enjoyed seeing Rainey's as, like, the tough politician side of her. Like, we the, the episode opened with, like, her on the Driftwood throne, and it seems that while Corliss is off at war in the Stepstones, Rainey's has been holding down the fort on Driftmark. And, you know, I, I think that that's a fun uh, contrast to Rainey's in previous episodes, where, like, I, I thought that her... <laughs> Her entrance to Driftmark um, in episode five was was so gorgeous when she like flounced through the door in the most sort of just fun and flamboyant way possible, going ah cousin, how are you doing? Like she's so just warm and fluffy. Uh, I, I really enjoyed her performance there, and it's such a stark contrast when Rainey's has to play the politician, and you know maybe her whole personality has just darkened as a result of the loss of her children. Like, that changes someone. Like, no one should have to lose one child, let alone live to see two of their children die under horrific circumstances. So maybe Rainies Rain Rain has just become, like, a darker, colder person. That's so sad to see after the wonderfully joyous side of her we saw earlier. Thanks for the super chat from Ron Sands, who says, Do you think the feud between the Blackwoods and Brackens comes back in this season or future seasons? Uh, well, it's in the books, and I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, it, it's not for no reason that the Brackens and the Blackwoods appeared um, in episode four. We saw this fight between a Blackwood kid and a Bracken, and then it was mentioned again in a later episode. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think part of what this is, is that they've showed us over and over that so much of the realm is eager for war. So much of the realm just cannot wait to start murdering each other, because, you know, just as the Targaryens and the Valerions and the Hightowers have their own feuds and their own ambitions, like, that is just a microcosm of the realm writ large, which is a even messier, even more angry and complicated um, bunch of ambitious people with even less to lose and even more grudges and history. Like, you know, everything that's that, that is happening in the Red Keep that there's just as much anger and bloodshed and, and hatred going on everywhere else. And after this long period of peace, many are eager for war. And the Blackwoods and Brackens <laughs> are um, foremost amongst those who want war. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we've seen the last of the Blackwoods and Brackens. 
Thanks for the super chat from Alex, who says, It's BS that Rhaenyra gets in so much trouble for being a woman, but she's allergic to responsibility. Are we talking about Ray? Ray? Are you talking about Rhaenys or Raina or Rhaenyra, Alex? That goes double for Aegon. Whoever wins the realm loses. Well, I can agree with that. Like, I... I mean, yeah, I mean, Rhaenyra had a moment here where she was crying by Viserys' bed, just going like, I, I didn't I didn't want to be heir to the throne. I didn't want any of this. The burden is so heavy. Why do I have to carry this if you're not supporting me properly? Um, and so, yeah, like, is it a good thing for the realm to Rhaenyra, for Rhaenyra to be in charge? Is it a good thing for Aegon or Alicent to be in charge? I mean, I do note that Alicent has said a few times, like, what is best for the realm? Like, when she was telling Viserys, hey, stop worrying about your petty issue with Daemon, go and take the Stepstones, go and kill Crabfeeder. If Crabfeeder's bad for the realm, let's kill Crabfeeder. And I think Alicent in this episode said something along the lines of, we must consider what's good for the people of the realm. So, you know, Alicent is one of the few people who's actually considering, hey, like, we are a government. <laughs> like, like in between all of the feuds and the feasts and the ballrooms and the cheating and the lying, like, like so, so, someone's got to be the government. And we have seen Alicent playing that role, you know? Like, we see her at the small council going like, hey, like, let's get some shit done. Let's try to do the right thing. So, you know, I, we've got to give Alicent some credit for that, I think. Pure rhetoric, Sam says in the live chat. I mean, Alicent was very dismissive of uh, poor Lyman Beesbury and his exhaustive accounting on the small council, but, um, you know, I still think Alicent is clearly putting some work in here and deserves some acknowledgement for that. Uh, another issue that they brought up, like, with this Valerion, uh issue, you know, Vaemon saying, hey, like, I should get to rule Driftmark because I'm actually a Valerion. But, like, another issue is that Luke, who is, you know, supposedly going to be the next Lord of Driftmark, Luke is not qualified to be the Lord of the Tides. Like, Luke has grown up on Driftmark and in the Red Keep. He's not like Corlys, who grew up on ships and on Driftmark. Like, if he's going to lead the, the navies of the world, of, of the Valerions, Surely he should, you know, he should have gotten some experience in that area, but he doesn't have it. Like, he's obviously not Valarion, he obviously doesn't have the experience, so, you know, I think that's just more reasons why we can be sympathetic to Vaymond, because he is speaking sense, and he is speaking truth when he says that Luke is should not be the Lord of Driftmark. Thanks for the super chat from <laughs> someone in the live chat says, Alicent is great if you like Catholicism. Yeah, the, the Faith of the Seven is just, it's just Catholicism with a slightly different hat. It's just Catholicism with a numerological bent. George Martin just took Catholicism, shaved off some filing, shaved off the serial number, and, or I don't know, maybe it's fucking Anglicanism. It's, it's, it's some Christi Christianity flavor that he's just called the Faith of the Seven. Um, and the whole sort of fractious relationship between the church and the Targaryens is similar to the fractious relationship between the, the, the church and the, you know, various kings of Europe, I think. Thanks for the super chat of Rabid Chew. Is that what happens to a, to a Pikachu if it gets rabies? Who says, I think they've done an excellent job setting up the personalities of the children. Can't wait to see more Amond team black all the way yeah I, I think they've done a good job as well i would like to see more from luke we have not seen a whole lot about what luke's deal is um jace seems to be a bit more you know he's he's the big brother so he's the more sort of confident dutiful one who's you know trying to trying to do the right thing whereas luke seems to have more doubts like i really i really felt for luke when Vaymond was, like, shouting, like, hey, Luke, you're not shit. You should not be the ruler of Driftmark. And, like, you know, I mean, we saw in the previous episode, like, Luke was saying, I don't want to be the Lord of Driftmark. I don't want more of my family to die. Poor little Luke. Like, that's him. And now he's grown up and it's like, I don't think he's any more convinced now that he wants to be the Lord of Driftmark than he was previously. But, you know, as is constantly the theme, the kids are being dragged along. So, uh... With the adults' ambitions. Thanks for the super chat from Promises, who says, What did Viserys mean at the end when he muttered, No more? And then when he said, My love. I think I think when Viserys said, My love, I think he was talking about Emma. 
I, I mean, like, if Viserys thought that he was talking to Rhaenyra at first, Emma's Emma's daughter, and the actor and the showrunners have talked about Viserys being very much um, in love with Emma still. So I, I think he was talking about Emma, but like in terms of no more, like I I think no more. I don't know. I guess. I guess Viserys could have been saying, like, no more conflict, no more violence. Like, I want my family to be together. I want no more division. I want no more of this crap. I wonder if also on some level he's saying no more pain. I wonder if Viserys, like, knows that he's dying on some level. He's saying, like, no more. Like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take any more of this pain. No more. He's sort of accepting death welcoming death his death has been a very slow painful long process he might welcome death uh maybe he's he's quoting poe never more never more i don't know what do you guys think viserys was saying yeah you guys are saying no more pain in the chat no more being alive no more torment no more milk of the poppy yeah that's a good point because he was saying earlier like i don't want any more of the milk of the poppy painkiller because it's like messing with his faculties so yeah, I think there's like several interpretations. No more milk of the poppy, no more pain, no more division, no more cowbell. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> thanks for the super chat from Luke, who asks about the cannibal. Yeah, well, look, we won't spoil anything, but uh, there's there's more dragons to come. Uh, I don't know what the uh, exact dragon situation is um, at this point, but like in the books at least, by this point, Aegon and Helena have some young children who have some young dragon hatchlings of their own but uh you know we'll see more of the dragon situation as it develops uh thanks for the super chat from robbie i th did we see harold westerling this episode i think we did thanks for the super chat from marcus who says in episode six when laris and alicent are talking talia the maid entered the room and laris went silent possible rivalry between laris and mazaria yeah, that's a good point. Like, at the time, I thought that, you know, Talia might have been working with Laris. But yeah, maybe Laris and Mazaria are, like, competing spy masters. Maybe there's only room for one Master of Whisperers in town. And uh, Laris and Mazaria are opposed to each other. Yeah, th th there's this whole sort of undercurrent, you know? Beware the beast beneath the boards. There's this whole undercurrent of the sort of control of information in this world. And uh, yeah, Laris and... Mazaria are like Google and Meta or something, you know? G Google and Apple. Google and Bing. iPod and Zune. Who will you choose, Laris or Mazaria? Thanks for the super chat from Lou, who says, Why did they cast Amond to look as though he's 35 years old and in a biker gang? <laughs> Yeah, well, look, I think Amond, Amond is, is a 35-year-old biker at heart. Uh, it, it may not make sense for him to look that old that quickly, but I think that, uh, I think that he is perfectly cast as an absolute shithead who wants to ruin your day, because that's what he is. It's, I, I think that that's the most important thing. Thanks for the super chat from Michael, who says, How did Otto scam his way into being Hand of the King again? We talked about this in the previous Explained video. Like, he, he just did the easy thing. Like, it was just easy to let Otto take power again, because he knows Otto, and he knows that Otto is biased towards Alicent, but Viserys does not find the strength inside himself to actually oppose Otto, so he's just like, fine. And, like, Alicent would have wanted Otto... Alicent was very clear earlier that she wanted Otto to be handed the king again, so Viserys just did the easy thing. And that's another thing that we can criticize Viserys for. Because if Viserys was serious about supporting Rhaenyra as heir, he should not have allowed Otto to be hand, given that Otto opposes Rhaenyra. So, you know, I, that's, Vis that's on Viserys, I think. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Icy, who wonders if there might be a rivalry between Amond and Daemon. Yeah, I don't think that, 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 that there's enough room in town for two men with such enormous egos uh, in the same room. So uh, who knows where their relationship might go. Thanks for the super chat from Mother Nix, who says, Jace and Helena's dance scene is a reminder of what could have happened if that marriage happened. Yeah, we spoke about that. Like, uh, Jason and Helena were potentially going to get married. Rhaenyra proposed that marriage. Um, and it was lovely to see them dancing. But I do think that Jace was partly dancing with Helena as a way of sort of messing with Aegon, who is Helena's husband now. So I don't know if Jace was entirely pure in, in that dancing scene. 
Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a sad reminder of what could have happened. Thanks for the super chat from Padraic, who says, I have a lab report due in two hours, but I can't study without that Viserys throne room entry song constantly. What is it called? I don't know. You'd have to ask Ramin Djawadi. Uh, I don't know what the what the scenes, what, what the musical themes are called. Um, but uh, thanks for the super chat from Jeff, who says, if they keep Oscar and Kermit Tully, that'd be something. Yeah, we talked in a previous video about how the uh, Tully characters in the books are named Oscar and Kermit and Elmo and Grover, who are Sesame Street characters, and and HBO currently owns the rights to Sesame Street, so no doubt we'll have a crossover and M Elmo will appear to talk about the importance of friendship and sharing at some point in the in the show. I don't think you... You don't need permission from Sesame Street to call a character Elmo. Or or are the, are the lawyers truly that bad that you can't use the name Elmo without paying a goddamn stipend to Sesame Street Incorporated? I don't know what the rules are. They should be able to call it whatever they want. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Nikhil, who says, Why was silencing Diana so important to Alicent? Well, I think partly, you know, if... Alicent allows it to be known that Aegon, her preferred claimant to the throne, um, is a sinner who does adultery and, you know, sleeps around, then that might be bad for her, especially personally, given her whole sort of stance against Rhaenyra. It makes Alicent a hypocrite if she lets people find out that Aegon sleeps around. And also, like, children of Aegon, if Aegon claims the throne... His bastard children could potentially claim the throne. I mean, it's like how Catelyn in Game of Thrones, uh, in the books, told Rob, like, hey, like, you know, bastards, like, I mean, even, you know, your bastard half-brother John, if you legitimize him, like, they are potential threats to you. Um, my, my point is that bastard children of Aegon could be rival claimants to the throne um, as rivals against Aegon's own trueborn children. It's like how in Game of Thrones Season 2, uh, or 3, Cersei had Robert Baratheon's bastards murdered. There was that horrible scene where Janos Slint and Alardim went out and slaughtered a bunch of babies and women. Um, in this world of bloodlines, you don't want royal bastards running around, mucking up the succession. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's religious, it's political, and it's personal, with Alicent silencing Diana. There's a lot of levels to that. Thanks for the... Oh, yeah, it was, it was interesting that she, uh, she she paid Diana as well. She was like, take the moon tea so that you don't give birth to a baby. And take this money, you know, sign this NDA, please. Um, and, you know, there's plenty to be said about Alison, you know, internalizing the patriarchy and becoming an enforcer of the system that has oppressed and restricted her, you know? Like, I think that Alicent has bought into this system. Like, she has followed the rules with, you know, uh, having her kids with her leprous... with her leprous husband, Viserys, and it's like she is so bought into this system that she wields the system as a weapon against people who break those rules that she had followed, I think. Thanks for the super chat from Alchemist, who says, In the show, John is the prince that was promised because he saved the world from Danny. That's the show's subversion. Yeah, well, one of many criticisms of Game of Thrones Season 8 is that they were not really clear about any of the prophecy stuff. Like, I don't... Like, like Melisandre sort of threw her hands up in Season 7 and said, eh, Daenerys and Jon, they both have roles to play in the prophecy. It's fine. And yeah, like, I think that's a reasonable interpretation, Alchemist. Like, in the final episode of Game of Thrones, Daenerys was saying, hey, let's conquer the world. It'll be great. And Jon was like, no, that won't be great. So she killed... So he killed Daenerys. So yeah, you could say that, you know... The White, Walk the White Walkers weren't the real threat to the world. The real threat to the world was Daenerys Targaryen, and Jon Snow saved the world by killing Daenerys. I think that's a fair interpretation. It's definitely a downer. It's definitely sad and nihilistic, but uh, yeah, I mean, that. I think that's not an unreasonable interpretation. Thanks for the super chat from Saruna, who says, Team Scarab. Are you referring to Laris's symbol? Uh, Laris's symbol is a firefly. Um, this little badge that he has on his minions. According to the HBO official guide, it is meant to be a 
Firefly, not a Scarab. Um, I I mean, a lot of people were saying that it's a bee because like a bee might pollinate Laris's flower and a bee might, you know, be busy and buzzing and making the, I don't know, <laughs> there's, there's, there's some symbolism you could draw. But no, at least according to HBO, it's a Firefly symbol that Laris uses. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Leon, who says Amon doesn't want the smoke with Daemon. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Blake, who says Viserys hated everyone during that walk. Paddy made me feel the pain in that moment. Yeah, that's that's the point. Like, I think Viserys felt resentment at everyone. Like, he, he, he dragged himself up onto the throne and he's saying, like, why do I have to do this? Why are you questioning the Valerion succession when the Valerion succession obviously should go to my true-born grandson, Luke Valerion? Um, he's an old man. He's very sick. Why should he have to do all this? Um, we can, yeah, I mean, maybe Viserys shouldn't have to do all this. Um, he didn't ask for this responsibility any more than Rhaenyra asked for this responsibility, you know? So, it's so funny that everyone is fighting over the right to be the ruler when it sucks so bad being the ruler. They are willing to to put each other through so much to get something that no one should want. Because no, no one enjoys being king. It's It's more for people like Otto who get to, you know manipulate the strings of power for the benefit of their own house. That, that That's who really benefits from any of this. Thanks for the super chat from Zoe, who says, Wait, so were Baylor and Rayna split up between Driftmark and Dragonstone shortly after their mum died? Yeah, sounds that way. So so was it Baylor on Driftmark and Rayna on Dragonstone? They weren't, they weren't super clear about that to me. Um, I hope we get to see more of Baylor and Reyna because, you know, now that they are betrothed to, to marry Luke and Jace, uh, they're going to be important, I would think. Thanks for the super chat from Ty, who says, did Alicent give Diana poison or moon tea? I, I, I think that she gave Diana moon tea. I don't think she murdered this girl. I mean, why would she, if she was murdering this girl, she wouldn't have needed to say all those things to that girl about, you better not talk, like, do these things for me. So yeah, it, it was moon tea, which of course mirrors Melos giving uh, Rainier a moon tea after her dalliance with Daemon. Thanks for the super chat from Siaran, who says, check out what Daemon becomes when you move the D to the end. You know what they say about moving the D to the end. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, Daemon and Amond are very similar names, just as they are quite similar characters. It's all about where you put the D. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Zach, who says, Fuck the Greens. Prince Daemon is my future king. That, that That's one of the other sort of like open questions here, right? Because like Rhaenyra is the heir to the throne. And Daemon is her husband. And so, on paper, like, theoretically, Daemon is going to become the king consort. He is going to become the husband of the queen, but not the ruler himself. Like, the idea is that Rhaenyra is the ruler, and Daemon is just her husband. So, you know, maybe Rhaenyra might choose to make Daemon her hand of the king. Or just some small council position, or just a military leader. Like, there's a bunch of different roles that Daemon could take. But I think that it would not be surprising to anyone if Daemon started wielding the power for himself. Like, if Rhaenyra allowed Daemon to sort of take the reins of power to some extent. Like, so I think a lot of people are worried that, you know, if Rhaenyra becomes queen on the throne, Daemon may rule through her. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's Rhaenyra's intention. I think Rhaenyra takes her responsibility seriously, and I think Rhaenyra would try to rule herself. But I think that's on a lot of people's minds, is like, you know, Rhaenyra becoming queen means Daemon being, like, one step from the throne. Some people might worry that Daemon might murder Rhaenyra and seize the throne for himself. I think a lot of people might consider that. I mean, Daemon did kill his previous wife, Rhea, or the, the previous previous wife, so... A lot of people worried about Daemon. Thanks for the... Su yeah, you, you can't spell Daemon without the D. you got to give the D, otherwise Daemon is not... Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Nicholas. Uh, no, I don't think that Alicent poisoned the serving girl. Um, I think that he gave... She gave her moon tea. Thanks for the super chat from Raquel, who says, What did you think about the symbolism of Jace and Helena dancing? And Viserys looking at them dancing. Uh, I mean, I think Viserys was happy to see the different sides of his family 
seemingly getting along. And Viserys was thinking, yay, this is peace. But of course, we have seen dancing as a sort of a symbol for combat. Like, Laenor Valerion uh, said to Rhaenyra at their wedding feast, oh, dancing is a lot like combat. Uh, Dancing is like fighting. Dancing is like killing. So you could also say that at the same time that this, you know, Helena Jace dance is really cute and lovely, it also could foreshadow violence. And of course, there there is a conflict in the Game of Thrones books called the Dance of the Dragons, um, which, you know, dance as a euphemism for war. So you can see the dancing in a few different ways. I guess dancing can also be seen as like a sexual thing, like dancing as a sort of a mating dance or like flirtation or whatever. So, you know, dancing is... Dancing is joy, and it's sex, and it's combat, and it's killing, and it's war, and it's it's all of those things. Thanks for the super chat from Smith, who says, Arya is Azora High. Her dagger, the cat's paw dagger, is Lightbringer. Night's King is Nissa Nissa. <laughs> Theory confirmed. Yeah, so the prophecy, uh, I mean, some of the legends around the prophecy mention Nissa Nissa, who is like the sacrifice victim who Azor Ahai kills in order to forge the blade Lightbringer. Um, and so maybe the Night King was the sacrifice who was was killed for the greater good. And now that the Night King was killed, that allows for the birth of a new kingdom. Sure, we can interpret it like that. Why not? Thanks for the super chat from Gunnar, who says that this episode felt like the calm before the storm. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed how they had literal thunder in the background in the Weirwood, and then there was rain when um, rain when Viserys died, so there, there certainly is the storm approaching. Uh, Irvin says, have they ever said the word black in the show? Yeah, so in the books, Alicent's side is called the Greens, and Rhaenyra's side is called the Blacks. And in the show, they have referred to Alicent's side as the Greens. Rhaenyra says that. Uh, but they've never talked about the Blacks. And I do wonder if they might avoid saying the Blacks in the show because they have made the Valerion, the Valerions dark-skinned and they don't want people being confused by what is meant by the Blacks because in the books that just refers to Rhaenyra's side, whereas people might think it's referring to skin colour. Uh, I think it would be lame if they, like, avoided saying the Blacks, because that, like, is one of the central terms for the political situation in the books. Some people have said, well, maybe they'll change it to, like, the Greens and the Reds, like, because the Targaryen colours are black and red. So instead of black, you could just as equally say red. I guess that would make sense. Um, But uh, I I think one of the episodes this season is called The Black Queen, uh, so that suggests that they might use the Blacks thing. So, yeah, I, I, yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm sure the live chat will be really, um, really mature about this issue. Thanks for the super chat from Non Dormiant, who says, Team Crab! Uh, yeah, Keltigars all the way. I, I, I want to believe that the Crab Feeder is a secret Keltigar. Thanks for the super chat from Dominique, who says, Amond wouldn't be as cool without the eye patch. R.I.P. Euron Greyjoy. Yeah, so Euron Greyjoy is one of the coolest and scariest characters in the books. He's a sorcerer and a, and a pirate king and a, and a hallucinogenic drug user and a kinslayer and a godslayer and a Lovecraftian absolute beast of a, of a man. And uh, in the TV show, they made him into this goofy-ass Pirates of the Caribbean Disney pirate who uh, did not did not scare anyone and did not even have an eye patch. What a travesty. Thanks for the super chat from Nathalie, Nathalie, who says, Do you think Viserys regrets naming his daughter as heir? I mean, even in episode one, when Viserys first made Rhaenyra heir, he was telling her, like, this is not a gift. Like, he was telling her, this is a heavy burden. This is a tough responsibility. I do not put this on you lightly. So from the very beginning, Viserys had some concerns, and he knew this would be hard for Rhaenyra. Um, and I think, you know, as the throne and the responsibility of power has destroyed uh, Viserys's body and mind, you know, like the psychological and emotional weight of the throne destroying him symbolically, if not literally, uh, I I think that he only has more (laughs) 
concerns and doubts about about what he's passing on to his daughter. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's probably an element of regret there. But you know, he did reaffirm his support for Rhaenyra. Um, like he never he never changed his mind. I, I mean, like I, I thought it's interesting that in the books, at least, when Viserys told Rhaenyra, "Hey, you're gonna marry Laenor." Um, and in the books, Rhaenyra did not want to marry Laenor. Like, she was very opposed to it. Um, partly because she knew that Laenor was gay and she didn't want a husband who wasn't attracted to her. And Viserys in the books said, Okay, Rhaenyra, if you don't marry Laenor, I'll disinherit you. And so that was the one thing that made Rhaenyra go, Okay, fine, I'll marry Laenor. So, like, in the books, Viserys did, like, consider disinheriting Rhaenyra. Whereas they didn't do that in a hot day, to my knowledge. So Viserys was like pretty, pretty consistent in his support of Rhaenyra, and the showrunners have said that that is connected to Viserys's love for Emma, his first wife. So uh, yeah, I think that Viserys, despite his fears, despite the weight that he was putting on his daughter, he um, he didn't back down because he didn't stop loving Emma, which I think is a really beautiful angle on Viserys's character. Thanks for the super chat from the real Neil, except no substitute, who says Amond is the scariest person. That strong toast was the highlight of the episode for me. Yeah, Amond insulted Jace and Luke by calling them strong. And it is like a wonderful checkmate. Because, you know, obviously, by calling Jace and Luke strong, Amond is calling Jace and Luke bastards. Because Jace and Luke are not the sons of Lenor Valerion. They are actually the bastard sons of Harwin Strong. And so Jace and Luke get angry, and Amond is like, Oh, why are you angry? It's only a compliment to say that you're so strong and muscular. Uh, so, you know, like, Jace and Luke can only get angry if they sort of admit that, like, yeah, like, Harwin Strong is our actual father, or, you know, allegedly. Um, so it is a fun way to be, like, passive-aggressive and to, like, call them bastards without calling them bastards. I, I, I do really like how fundamentally, you know, like, yes, you know, 87% of you in that poll agreed that Rhaenyra and her family are the good guys, but Rhaenyra and her family are the liars who are, who, who have, you know, bastard children and are saying that they're not bastards. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's cool how, you know, it makes us side with the liars, which sort of puts us in a difficult position morally and legalistically, because this whole monarchy relies on, you know, the honest application of these inheritance laws. Uh, just like Vaymond was saying, you know, like, like it's kind of hard to disagree with Vaymond when he's saying that the truth is obvious, and yet they're like gaslighting Vaymond and gaslighting Allison and making us side with the liars. It's fun. It's fun. Uh, Keith says, how did he get his eye cut out? Uh, well, Amond got his eye slashed out by, um, got his eye slashed out by Luke. Eur how did, how did Euron Greyjoy lose his eye? Do, do the books say how Euron Greyjoy lost his eye? I don't, am I, am I crazy or does the books not say how Euron lost his eye? I, well, no, he didn't lose his eye. He, he hasn't lost his eye. He just has, like, a, a black eye underneath. Like, he's got two eyes. He's got his smiling eye, and then he's got his, like, black, scary eye. Because it's just like, you know, sailors and pirates, they wear an eye patch so that they can, um, so that they can, like, go from below decks to above decks without losing their night vision or whatever the crap, right? Yeah. Yeah, Euron has two eyes, but I think there is, like, we, we've never seen what's underneath his eye patch, really. And Theon has this dream where he like see yeah the blood eye and it's like and and he's and Theon is like deathly afraid of like the black eye underneath the eye patch and there's all this stuff about like Euron may have you know gr green seer sight he may have been a student of blood raven so it's like the third eye the magic eye the dark eye the evil eye all sorts of wonderful scary magical uh, symbolism going on so. Uh, so yeah, there's a really um, metal character called uh, Crow Food Umber in the books, and Crow Food Umber uh, lost an eye because, like, I think he got like he got like wounded in a battle, and um, while he was lying there, like half dead, a raven came and ate his eye out of his socket, and then he like killed the raven or something, and now Crow Food Umber wears a chunk of dragon glass in his eye socket 
which is just so cool and metal and ridiculous. And it's such a shame that we didn't get that sort of fun stuff in the show. Thanks for the super chat from Watt, who says, I wish they did more practical makeup for Viserys' face rot. It's supposed to be unsettling, but it looks a bit fake. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I think that Viserys' like, rotted face with the missing eye and the, the hole in his, in his cheek... Sometimes it looked good, sometimes it looked a bit, you know, fake. Um, I, w- what I did like about Vaemon's messed, about Viserys' messed up face was the sound of his breath going through his cheek hole. Like, if you listen, there's this weird, gross, sort of, like, gasping, breathy sound, which I think was meant to be the air going through the hole in Viserys' face. And it, like, maybe the the hole didn't look good all the time, but the sound of it I thought was very unsettling and very effective, personally. Um, that was really intense. And it's reminiscent of, um, it's reminiscent of bloody... Bloody, bloody, who am I thinking of? The Hound, Sandor Clegane. Sandor Clegane also has um, a lot of missing face bits. Like in the show, it's just like, oh, we'll just put some, just put some makeup on his cheek. But in the books, he's he's it's like raw, burned, fucked up flesh. It's like real gnarly Sandor's wounds in um, in the books. Like I think he's got like a hole in his cheek and everything in the books. So um, sort of reminds me of that. Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Smythe, who says, Amond is great, looks a lot like David Bowie. Look, I would love to see this guy belt out um, belt out some Bowie, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have to wait for season two. Thanks for the super chat from Viserys, who says that Viserys... The super chat from Ricky, who says that Viserys gazes up at the Iron Throne with such contempt his reluctant acceptance of the heavy duty he was given. Yeah, I I think that that sequence was so powerful in showing Viserys' relationship with power and relationship with politics and, like, how it was just this insurmountable object for him. Like, he, he just could not handle this this terrible burden. And, yeah, he, yeah I, I guess resent was part of it. It's like, he, why do I have to do this? Why does anyone have to do this? And, I mean, and, of course, part of the answer is, well, the bloody council at Harrenhal is why he has to do this. Because he was chosen by the lords of the realm to rule as king because the realm did not accept Rhaenys or Lainor. Um, it, it was partly... It, it, that decision is the reason why Viserys has to drag himself up these steps all these years later. So, I, you know, I, I think it's an indictment of the system and of the lords and partly of, you know, the patriarchy that refuses to accept a woman and prefers a man, Viserys. I mean, you know, in the books, it was more about Rhaenys' son, Laenor, versus Viserys at the Council at Harrenhal. But in the show, they framed it more about Rhaenys versus Viserys and the realm wanting a man, not not the female Rhaenys. Thanks for the super chat from Significant Ice, who says, Do you think HBO plans on fixing the Prince That Was Promised prophecy in the Snow sequel somehow? Yeah, so there is... It has been reported, including by George Martin, uh, that there is a Jon Snow TV show in early development. And, you know, when something's in early development, it, it may or may not happen. But apparently Kit Harrington's excited and George Martin's excited, so maybe they're going to make more Jon Snow snuff, Jon Snow stuff. I, I I don't I don't love the idea, but if George Martin thinks it's a good idea, then maybe it is. Um, I, I think it would be very weird to make a sequel to Game of Thrones season eight. I, I think it would have to be a very different kind of show. I, I I don't think going back on the prince that was promised. I mean, they could bring back the White Walkers and they could make Jon defeat the White Walkers. And then that sort of retroactively makes the Prince That Was Promised stuff make more sense. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want it. Thanks for the super chat from MZ Kim, who says the artistry in this show is top notch. The costumes, sets, props, all amazing. Really happy this is better than the last few seasons of Got. The costuming especially, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the costuming like in Game of Thrones season eight was like mostly just black leather outfits. Whereas here, there's so much character in the outfits. Like, I, I mean, Alicent definitely had one of the more notable costumes in this episode. The chain, the restraint, the Faith of the Seven symbol, 
uh, the sort of like proud shoulders. I thought that Amon's outfit also had a sort of a dragony aspect to it. Like Amon had these sort of wing-like shoulders because I think that Amon is proud of his connection to uh, Vega, the greatest dragon in the world. Um, yeah, look at these like proud, prominent wing-like shoulders that Amon has. So yeah, I think that the costumes tell us a lot about the characters. That was really fun. Thanks for the super chat from Rackney, who says, I can't help but like Amond. He's clever and seems to understand what is going to come next. Amond definitely seems more aware than, like, Aegon and Helena are. Like, I mean, like, Helena sees the future, but doesn't quite seem to consciously comprehend what it all means. She's sort of off with the fairies. And Aegon is just either in his wine or in his in his biddies, um, so he's not really paying much attention. A Amond is the guy who's like... I, I want to, like, be a part of this. I want conflict. I want to get revenge. Like, yeah, I, I, I think I agree with that. And, you know, he, his intentions do not seem great. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Dylan. Uh, we don't want to do any spoilers, um, but there are interesting possibilities with the Valerions. Thanks for the super chats from Brian, who says, I don't like the high towers, so I don't like the greens, but the blacks made many mistakes before the war even started. I just feel bad for the kids involved, especially the strong boys. Yeah, I, I feel eternal sympathy for the children dragged into the wars of their parents. Um, I think that Rhaenyra's mistake in hooking up with Harwin Strong is, like, the original sin in this show. Like, if Rhaenyra just hooked up with someone who looked like Laenor, like a Valerion cousin or just someone on Driftmark or just someone who looked vaguely like Lenor, like even just like someone with Valyrian hair like there are lots of people in like Lys and like the East and, and on Dragonstone there are lots of people on Dragonstone who have Valyrian features and if Rhaenyra had her bastard children with one of those people so that her children looked plausibly like Lenor's children this whole conflict may never have happened so I think Rhaenyra does have a huge amount of culpability for this entire conflict Thanks for this super chat from Ludacris, who says, The show is amazing, but I don't like how straight evil the greens are, which the creators said that they would try to correct from the books. Aegon is a rapist, Amond is Amond, and Otto and Alicent are self-serving. Yeah, I mean, that's something that people say about the books as well. Like, I think they are being faithful to the books in making the greens look more dickish than the blacks. I mean, we'll see how it continues. I, I think that, you know, last episode in particular, I think they did a lot to sort of give us an insight into Alicent's position and to see why she feels the way she does, how she feels trapped, how she feels resentful. But, I mean, even Alicent's actor herself, Olivia Cook, says that, like, she can't defend all of Alicent's actions. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that the Greens generally seem more villainous. Um, Raphael says, why does Aegon look younger than Amond? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people complaining that Amond looks old. Maybe he's just aged before his time as a result of pure anger. <laughs> Losing his eye, you know, riding Vega. I mean, it's probably not good for your skincare uh, regime to be riding Vega all the time. I mean, all those seagulls that Amond took to the face... It's gonna, it's gonna give you crow's feet before you know it. Thanks for the super chat from Boy, who says, Wondering where the clubfoot was in all this. Seems like a lot of fun for him to be missing out on. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, Laris would have been interested in all of these goings on. I mean, I wonder if Laris is interest, is listening from beneath the floorboards, you know, the beasts beneath the boards. And we did see a mouse or a rat... Uh, on v on the Valyrian model city in Viserys's room, so that you know it seems like they are connecting the the mice to Laris and his spying. So I think it's possible that Laris has some presence in this episode, even if it's not directly on screen. Um, and Boy says, "What happened to our good friend Glidus? Yeah, there is a wonderful Game of Thrones YouTube channel called Glidus that you should all go and subscribe to. And Glidus has been having a um having a bit of a time with the uh, weekly upload schedule with house of the dragon i think but i think that schedules i mean time is an illusion and youtube upload schedules doubly so so uh i, I think there'll be more glidus bliss take videos soon um if not in a strictly weekly sequence i think there'll be more so go and subscribe to glidus 
Thanks for the super chat from Dylan, who says, who inherits Viserys' Warhammer set? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's the deal. Maybe Viserys is like, okay, like, Rhaenyra gets the throne, and Alicent gets my, um, my Necromunda set. My, my, my Tal, Tyranid, Carnifex, uh, uh, and my Adeptus Sororitas and Mechanicus. They get my toys, and Rhaenyra gets the throne, which is an equally valuable prize. Thanks for the super chat from Tackett, who says, Pass on the snow show, just give me Dunk and Egg. Yeah, there is also talk of a Dunk and Egg uh, TV show in early development, and I would be pretty keen for that, but as I've said before, the Dunk and Egg book series is not finished and I I want the books to be finished before they start making the Duncan Egg show because there is some wonderful, dark, powerful stuff uh, foreshadowed to happen um, towards the end of Duncan Egg, and I want to read that on paper before I see it on screen. But uh, we're gonna have to uh, get some more books from the Fat Man before that happens. Whose plan? The Fat Man's plan that changes with every moon. That there is a wonderful fourth wall breaking moment in um book five when i think george is talking about himself when he writes about illyrio's plans changing just as george's publications plans have pub- publication plans have changed oh george we love you thanks for the super chat uh who says why did amond look like he'd fallen in love when daemon sliced off Vaymon's head jesus christ amond daemon Vaymond. i've got to enunciate uh, and the looks they gave each other at dinner were so flirty. Look, da- Daemon is um, uh, bisexual, sort of, canonically. I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's questionable canon, but there's there's some bisexual vibes from Daemon in Pentos. Uh, maybe maybe Daemon and Amon don't hate each other. Maybe they just really need a snog. Who knows? Um, I think that Amond might have been happy when Vaymond died because Amond is keen for violence. I think Amond is very clearly, he doesn't want peace, he wants um, revenge, he wants violence, he wants to prove himself. I mean, much like Daemon himself. Like, I think that Daemon looks at Amond and sees, it's like looking in the mirror, it's like seeing a younger version of himself. I think Amond now is like what Daemon used to be. Like, I get the sense that Amon, that Daemon has matured a bit and he has become a bit more peaceful because he's a dad now he's a dad to Bela and Reyna he's a dad to Aegon and Viserys um I think that Daemon has mellowed a bit I mean he's still very happy to cut off a dude's head in the middle of a conversation uh, but that's still relatively chill by his standards it, there's a great scene where Jamie Lannister talks to Loras Tyrell in the books and Jamie looks at Loras and goes wow this impetuous rude arrogant twerp is me. This this rambunctious, talented teenager is just like what I was like when I was his age. And and I think that Daemon might see Amond in a similar way. You know, this this was me when I was a when I was full of spunk and bluster. Thanks for the super chat from William, who says so much strength in such a weak and decaying body. Yeah, everyone I think has been moved by Viserys's performance here that mask is so creepy as well what's with that like line going down the mask is that meant to be like it looks it looks a little bit like a river of tears from his eye or like a river of blood like it's a very creepy design my goodness thanks for the super chat from Edo, who says, highly enjoying all the discussions you bring for us thank you for making this tv watching experience a real treat Thanks, Edo. Glad you're enjoying. William said, hoping for Daemon and Amond to have dialogue. Yeah, I would like to see that too. There are so many characters in this show. They have to be very selective about, you know, who actually gets scenes together. Um, It's a real juggle. I mean, right, like, it is shocking how well this show has gone so far, honestly. I was not expecting this show to be this good. It's not easy because, like, they do have a skeleton of the story in Fire and Blood, but there's very little detail to draw on. There's a lot of different ways it could have gone. There's a lot of different ways this show could have been a catastrophe, honestly, and I think they've done a uh, surprisingly good job. 
Thanks for the super chat from Jarek, who says, Any thoughts on how the Viserys in Game of Thrones had a golden face at the end of his life as well? Ah, that's an interesting point, Jarek. Because, uh, yeah, Viserys Targaryen in uh, the original Game of Thrones show, not in House of the Dragon, was the brother of uh, Daenerys Targaryen, and he died under a golden crown. Khal Drogo poured molten gold onto his face. So just like Viserys has a golden mask, uh, Viserys has a golden mask now. Yeah, that's a cool point. I wonder if that was deliberate. Probably. Um, and, you know, I guess, like, in some symbolic sense, you know, that golden mask represents how, you know, power is killing Viserys, you know, like, his responsibilities and his stress, uh, is what has caused his physical deterioration in some sense, and, uh, in the same way, it's, Vis it's Viserys Targaryen's, Danny's brother's, um, you know, sort of desire and ambition and, you know, wanting power is what leads to him dying, with his face covered by gold. So yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's a cool parallel. Thanks for the super chat from Tim, who says, Rhaenyra said Seven Kingdoms a lot, but Dawn isn't in the fold yet, is it? Yeah, so the whole Seven Kingdoms thing um, is an anachronism. Um, there aren't currently Seven Kingdoms, but I think there were Seven Kingdoms when Aegon the Conqueror took over Westeros, because at the time, um, the Iron Islands and the Riverlands were one kingdom. Like, the Iron, the Ironborn conquered the Riverlands under Harren Hor. He was the guy who built Harren Hall. Um, and also there's, like, the Crown Lands, which may or may not count as its own kingdom, which is just the region around King's Landing. Because, yeah, but yeah, like, Dawn is currently not in the Seven Kingdoms. So, like, depending how you count it, there's as many as, like, nine kingdoms with like the North and the Iron Islands and the Vale and the Riverlands and the Westerlands and the Crownlands and the Stormlands and the Reach and Dawn. Um, so there's a few ways to count it. But I think that when Aegon conquered Westeros, there were seven kingdoms and they called it seven kingdoms. But I mean, also like they introduced Viserys this episode as the king of the First Men and the Andals and the Rhoynar. And the Rhoynar are an ethnic group in Dawn. So it's funny that the Targaryens are claiming authority over Dawn when they don't actually rule Dawn, and Dawn has not submitted to them. So, I mean, a bit like in real history, there's anachronisms, the names don't necessarily make sense anymore, and, you know, that's... that's what. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? Um, Jesus Christ. Uh, and anyway, thanks for the question. <laughs> thanks for the question from J.O., who says, The most annoying part about the prophecy is that there is no way Viserys wouldn't have told all of the family about the prophecy as a means to get them to reconcile. I mean, let's be honest, J.O., if you went to Thanksgiving dinner with your family and then your father, Viserys, said, hey guys, you need to stop fighting because there are these icy, frosty zombies who are going to come from the distant north. They're going to come down from Canada and they're going to march on Washington with a bunch of walking dead so therefore you need to marry your cousin like would you take that seriously i mean people don't believe in the white walkers i mean i guess the targaryens might be a little more amenable to the white walker thing seeing as the targaryens you know ride dragons and you know they are magical and they do sort of believe um in such things but yeah like i, I don't know if people would listen to the whole prophecy thing necessarily um but you know i generally i agree like i think that if they're taking the White Walker thing seriously, they should be telling everybody about it. And I think that could be a way of strengthening the Targaryen, like, sort of political, cultural claim to the throne. Like, if they said, hey, this is not just about Targaryen power, this is about divine right. This is about, you know, the Targaryens will protect the world from the White Walkers. And regardless of whether that's true, it might be a way to, like, secure more political support for themselves, you know? Um, MF says that Viserys's left arm grows back at the 41 minute mark, does it? They have made a, a couple of, um, CGI mistakes. Uh, Viserys's left arm is meant to be missing, um, but, uh, apparently we see it at some point, do we? 
That would not shock me. Thanks for the super chat from Winifrey iPhone 4, who says, really liked hearing elements of the King's Arrival theme from Game of Thrones during Viserys' dramatic entrance. Yeah, I mean, that could be a sort of an ironic um, use of the music, you know, playing a song of strength while showing Viserys' physical weakness. Uh, we've been streaming for two hours, so we're going to wrap this up pretty shortly. Um, I'm going to answer as many super chats as I can quickly, and uh, then I think we'll move on to a brief uh, look at the preview of the next episode. Uh, we'll, we'll warn you if, if you want to avoid that before we do it. Uh, but let's do a little lightning round. Dark Azazel says, What was your reaction when Daemon sliced Vaemon's head? Yeah, it was fun and surprising, because uh, it's different to the books. Um, I guess, it's, yeah, I guess I can say what happens in the books. In the books, um, oh, well, maybe they'll do it later. I won't say. Um, but yeah, I liked how they showed that Valyrian steel really is sharp and special as well. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Jess, who says Aegon and Viserys, who are the baby children of Rhaenyra and Daemon. It was fun to see them. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Zevi, who rightfully points out an issue. Thanks for the super chat from Musa, who says the very conspicuous two second appearance of Lord Caswell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we we did briefly see Lord Caswell greeting Rhaenyra and Daemon outside the Red Keep. Um, and Lord Caswell we saw in episode 6, I think, when Caswell was, uh, ah, let me be the first to congratulate you, Radiera, on you having a baby. Good work. Um, so Lord Caswell is a lord in the Reach, and uh, it looks like he's positioning himself as an ally to Rhaenyra, which might be useful later on. Thanks for the super chat from Bill, who says, Did you notice Crispin Cole... <laughs> was swinging a steel morning star at Amond. Yeah, it seems like a very dangerous way to train. Like, you know, they they sometimes wear um they sometimes use blunted swords for training and they sometimes wear like lots of padded armor and lots of armor. But uh yeah, Amond and Kristen were pretty yolo just swinging live steel at each other. And I don't know, maybe that's just a more effective way to train. But, uh, yeah, you, there's, there's an element of danger there. I know that the Kristen actor, Fabian Frankel, was saying that uh, it's extremely hard to swing a morning star around without hitting yourself in the balls. So um, let, let's all send our best wishes to Fabian Frankel's testicles. Uh, Clearbright says, I appreciate your channel and all the insight it affords. Uh, also, uh, can't wait for Daemon and Amon to dance. I hope they have a boogie. Thank you, Shinokyuko, who says, Viserys saying no more might have been him remembering Emma telling him no more kids before her death. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, because in the conversation in the bath with Emma and Viserys, Emma was saying, this is the last child I will bear for you. I don't think she said no more, but she said, you know, there will be no more children from me, uh, which was right in more ways than she knew. Um, so yeah, maybe that's what Viserys was thinking. Thanks for the super chat from Lyserko, who says, Alicent feeling bad for the servant girl and showing more compassion to her than to her own son. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that Alicent was partly, like, threatening this girl and manipulating her by sort of pretending to be tender, but also threatening her not to talk about Aegon getting her pregnant. Like, I thought this was quite, you know, I, I thought that this hand on the back of Diana's head was very sort of possessive um, on her head. But but yeah, like, it was so harsh the way that Alicent, like, slapped Aegon and said, you are no son of mine, which is a pretty fucking heavy thing to say to your kid. Um, and it's reminiscent of Tywin, because Tywin told Tyrion, you are no son of mine, uh, in the in the books at least. I think in the show he might have said, you are not my son. Whatever. Um, but yeah, that was real rough. Uh, Alicent is not affectionate to her kids. Alicent does not have a lot of... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and Alicent had the kids very young and, you know, the actor talked about them being almost more like siblings than like children. And Al Alicent's actor talked about Alicent feeling jealous of Rhaenyra being such a good mother. It's a whole thing. Thanks for the super chat from Elm, who says, When do you believe we will go beyond the wall? 
the way episode 8 ends, I'm under the impression we might get a glimpse of what terror lies beyond. Yeah, I mean, they might not. Like, there's nothing in the books about White Walkers um, in Fire and Blood. Nothing direct, anyway. But uh, without spoiling anything, yeah, there are opportunities to do a bit of that. So who knows? Like, they are talking a lot about the prophecy, so maybe they will introduce a little bit of Whitey Walkie goodness. Thanks for the donation from Zach, who says Daemon is the definition of fuck around, find out. Schwab says... Daemon's dong. Okay, you, you thought we were literally talking about Daemon's penis. Uh, Ian says, no more was referring to being tested, as talked about with Lionel Strong. This episode was his crucible, and Viserys died, thinking he united the realm. Yeah, there was that conversation with Lionel, where Viserys was like, will I be remembered as a good king? Did I do the right thing? And I think that right at the very end, he uh, decided, yeah, I'm going to do the right thing. And he died thinking that he had succeeded. But little does he know, um, right as soon as he left the table, his grandsons started attacking each other. So, I mean, at least he got to die r relatively happy, but um, he was mistaken if he thinks that he made peace. Uh, Vaughn, uh, yeah, we talked about Alicent, you know, saying you're no son of mine, just like Tywin. It's a really heavy, cruel thing to say to your child. Like, I mean, Aegon is, you know, biologically the son of Alicent and Viserys, but I think that Alicent feels a lot of frustration with Aegon because he, you know, keeps on having sex with people when he shouldn't and he doesn't take his responsibilities seriously. And so Alicent expresses that frustration with a lot of antagonism, which is really sad. Uh, Jesus says, I'm team Rhaenyra, but I sympathize with Alicent. She knows her kids are bad, but she just saw Daemon kill Vaemond for speaking truth. Who's next? Yeah, I, I think that I think that Rainier probably is more sympathetic, but I think that um, we can definitely sympathize with both sides. Mick says, "Fireflies. Any connection to dragon fire? Yeah, that's that's a good uh, that's a good comparison because you know Laris using the firefly as his symbol. It's like saying that well, you know, I'm not a dragon. I'm not big and powerful and tough and controlling a great weapon of war. I don't have a nuke on wings, but I can still wield." fire. I can still wield fire through manipulation and with my firefly people. So, you know, yeah, like, that's kind of cool. That's like, well, I'm not as tough as you Targaryens, but I've still got my own fire and I can still wield destruction. Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Tay, who says, Alicent is being willfully ignorant. She probably knows the prophecy from being with Viserys. Plus, she knows Aegon would be a terrible king. I don't think that Alicent knows about the prophecy. Like, if she knew about the prophecy, I think she would have reacted differently to Viserys' last words. Um, and I think that Viserys was pretty clear about, like, we only tell the heir to the throne about the prophecy. But yeah, I think Tay is being... I think, sorry, I think Alicent is sort of willfully misinterpreting Viserys' last words and choosing to think that it's about Aegon. But I mean, you know, like, Alicent was just saying... Rhaenyra, you're going to be a, a great queen, and we should be friends again. And I and I think that Alison does mean it um, when she says that. So I, I don't think that in this moment Alicent is like 100% like, fuck Rhaenyra, I'm going to support Aegon. Um, I think that there will be further developments. Thanks for the super chat from Claire, who says, Rhaenyra has five children now. She is certainly much luckier than her mother. Yeah, Rhaenyra has five children now. Jace and Luke and Joff with uh, Harwin and Viserys and Aegon with Daemon. And Rhaenyra is pregnant again. They didn't make a big deal of it, but, but Rhaenyra is currently pregnant. You can see that she's a bit pregnant, so... Um, so maybe she'll have six children soon. Thanks for the super chat from Mike. And yeah, I mean, as you say, like, we saw a lot about the dangers of pregnancy with Emma and with Lena. So uh, I, I think that we can look forward to more horrifying childbirths as the story continues. Thanks for the super chat from Mike, who said they expected a big naval dragon battle with Vaymond. Alas, Vaymond did not get to do much, but um, he's got family. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Orc, who says, We're all forgetting that Daemon's children can't be king 
unless he gets those strong kids out of the way. So of course he encourages Vaymond to call them bastards. Yeah, so when Vaymond called Jace and Luke bastards, yeah, Daemon was sort of egging him on. I think Daemon was egging him on because he wanted to kill Vaymond and remove the threat to Rhaenyra's claim. But yeah, like, Daemon is a, not a great guy, and he's murdered people before um, for, you know, his own political freedoms. So yeah, like, it would not be crazy to suspect that what if Daemon killed Rhaenyra's sons so that his own sons, Aegon and Viserys, could claim the throne instead. I think that's a reasonable suspicion. I mean, would Daemon do something so horrible against Rhaenyra, who he loves or seems to love? Who knows? But things may evolve. Multiguy says, Couldn't Targaryen bastards claim dragons? I could see how that might cause issues. That is an extremely good question that may be relevant later on. I'm pretty sure dragons... Look, I'll, I'll say this. I don't think dragons care if your parents were married. I don't, I don't think dragons are quite that legalistic. So, uh, yeah, that's a relevant question. Boz says, Lots of references to the prince that was promised... Do you think that the snow show might fulfill the prophecy? Uh, yeah, maybe Val the Wildling will play the role of the Night's Queen. I think it would be weird if the Jon Snow sequel show talks about the prophecy much, but um, we'll see. Uh, McGreeny Pants says, Alicent killed Diana with poison. I don't think it was poison. I mean, she did ask about Diana later, so maybe it was poison, but my interpretation was that it's moon tea. We'll, we'll go back and have a look at that later. Uh, Mark says, good day. Thank you, Mark. G1 says, Rhaenyra isn't aware of Lenor's survival. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Like, 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 Rhaenyra said to Rhaenys, hey, like, I didn't murder your son, Lenor. Um, but Ra what Rhaenyra could have said is, uh, hey, Rhaenys, not only did I not murder your son, Lenor, but your son, Lenor, wasn't murdered at all and is alive in the East, or in a rowboat, at least. Um... She could have said that, but she didn't. And I guess the reason why Rhaenyra didn't tell Rhaenys that her son is alive is that then Rhaenys would probably want to reunite with her son and would probably find her son and bring her son back. And then all of a sudden, Rhaenyra would have two husbands, Lenor and Daemon, and that would be embarrassing for everyone. So, um, so yeah, I, I guess she, she couldn't tell Rhaenys the truth. And I wonder if Rhaenys might ever find out, you know? What if what if Rhaenys finds out that Lenor was alive when Lenor dies for real? <laughs> Maybe Lenor will die in the east, and then Rhaenys will find out that oh my god, my son was alive all these years. That would be crazy. That would be dark. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, there's people arguing in the chat about whether Alicent murdered Diana, the serving girl. I, I don't think she did, but we'll we'll go back and have a look at it later. Thanks for the super chat from Mason, who says, Rhaenyra with Viserys was on her good side. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I think that Viserys's like, rotted face side was on the green side, which, you know, does sort of cast the greens as, as villains. Like, the mask side, the rotten side is Alicent's side, whereas the healthy side is Rhaenyra's side. So they are sending us signals that, like, Rhaenyra's side are the good side. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Elhan, who says, Did Helena already have Aemon's childrens? Helena is married to Aegon, um, and at least in this point in the book, uh, they do have kids. Maybe that will, um, maybe we'll see that soon on the show. Uh, thanks, Ashley, who also complains about Amon. Uh, well, apparently, all right, Amon's actor is only 20. So for all the people complaining that he looks old, um, I think that's just um, just uh, poor skincare. He's actually only 20, apparently. Uh, Glock was looking for Laris. Nick says Aegon looks younger than the previous actor. Yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with that. Like the new Aegon actor doesn't look much older than the uh, previous Aegon actor. Michael says that why doesn't Helena why doesn't Viserys thinks it thinks it, why doesn't Viserys thinks it why doesn't Viserys think it's weird that Helena is talking prophecies almost like she's being warged into there's a fun idea maybe Helena is actually being warged into by blood raven through time and space who is trying to prevent the dance and prevent the downfall of his ancestors that's a fun idea um 
And yeah, you would think that Viserys would be more interested in Helena's prophecies since Viserys is, or at least was, obsessed with prophecies himself. Like, Viserys was going on about, ooh, Targaryen dreamers are so rare and so special. And his own daughter is a Targaryen dreamer, and yet he doesn't ever have a conversation with her that we've seen. So I think Viserys is, like, not a great dad, uh, not very attentive to his children with Alicent. I mean, to be fair, his body parts are... A, a falling off day by day so he's a bit distracted but um yeah it's sad that Viserys isn't a closer father uh Anglebor says Viserys's last means no more Viserys's last words no more mean no more prophecies uh maybe Brian says I loved the version of the King's Arrival song played when Viserys comes in almost got an ironic vibe to it Dominique says that Amond wouldn't be as cool without the eye patch. I completely agree Mother Nix says the episode was very Shakespearean. Viserys let go of life at the end because the family stuff was resolved. Yeah, it's almost like a ghost can finally, you know, go to the afterlife after the ghost's unfinished business is done. Like, Viserys was, like, already dead in so many ways, you know? Like, physically, it was like he was a ghost already, you know? But he could only leave and move on to the next life after he finished his business and was satisfied that his family was at peace. And of course, he was uh, completely wrong. Musa hopes that Amond might have a sapphire underneath his eye patch. Fig says, I love Amond. And the strong insult was great. Thank you, Darius, for the shout out. Thank you, Varsoon, who says, Rhaenyra said that Daemon would help assure her claim to the throne. She didn't mean by cutting people in half. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Like, like I, I think that Rhaenyra marrying Daemon, you know, she wants strength in order to claim the throne. And she, and it's not just about, you know, D Daemon's claim as Viserys' brother, and it's not just about, you know, political laws and so on. It's also about the fact that everyone knows that Daemon is a stone-cold killer with a cool-ass squeaky dragon, and you don't want to fuck with him. He's got Dark Sister, he's a badass, and he's not afraid of nothing. So yeah, that's definitely part of why um, Rhaenyra married him, and he provides strength to her. Inquisitor says, Every faith seems to have some truth, except for the Seven. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole big can of worms. But like, you know, the religion of the old gods has the very, very real power of skin changing and warging and the children of the forest... And the magic of the drowned god resuscitates people, or it seems to have, like, some power that, like, Euron is tapping into. Well, I, I don't know, the drowned god is maybe bullshit as well. Um, but there's lots of different religions, and, and the Faith of the Seven seems to be the least powerful. I mean, R'hllor has those, like, shadow assassin babies that Melisandre births. So there is real magic behind some of the religions, but the Faith of the Seven doesn't have any real religious miracles that we can point to so i think that the faith of the seven is more the sort of sanitized institutional religion as opposed to the real raw powerful magical religion i think that's a fair point thanks for the super chat from av who says that rainera in episode three killed a boar a high the pig that was promised yes uh blood raven was warging the pig of course and was going to use it to um become the pig king i mean me, me, i mean maybe the the pink dread was the child of the boar that rainiera killed and therefore the pink dread is azora high so don't worry av motaz says that rainiera doesn't seem to know that Lenor is alive i think that rainiera does know that Lenor is alive she just couldn't tell rainies that Lenor is alive or else rainies would go and find Lenor, and then rainy rainiera would have two husbands um, I think that Helena's comment about what's under the floorboards could refer to spies in the Red Keep. It could refer to the lurking danger beneath their, you know, beneath appearances. And it also could refer to something that's going to happen later on in the story. Uh, Frank says, how old is Viserys? Um, I'm sure someone in the chat can do the math. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how old he is. I mean, I might have, I might have it written down. Um, I think that he is... Alright, I think he's 51. I think that King Viserys is 51 or 52 years old at this point. In the books, at least. They, I, I think they changed the ages in the show, so maybe that's no longer true. But at least in the books, I think Viserys is about 50. 
Thanks for the super chat from Vaymon's Tongue, who says it's cruel to let Rhaenys think that Laenor is dead. I agree. I I would love to see Rhaenyra tell Rhaenys the truth. And I think that their discussion about Laenor here um, might sort of foreshadow that. So, yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Neymar, who says the who says does Rhaenys raise Daemon's daughters? Yeah, I think that Bela is on Driftmark with Rhaenys, while Rhaena is on Dragonstone with Rhaenyra and Daemon. I think that's the situation. Maybe it's the other way around. It's hard to keep track of the twins, but I hope we'll see more of Rayla, Rhaena and Bela later. Rhaena and Bela later. Segi says I appreciate that they aged up Aegon before showing us his gooch. Yeah, well, look, it's got to be, the gooch has to be of age. Joshua says, according to the logic of the show, the greens are correct, but in my heart, I side with the guillotine. <laughs> the guillotine. Oh my god, Joshua. Gingerbread says, Helena wearing gold this episode instead of green. Do you think that's foreshadowing or relevant? Yeah, well, I mean, maybe she was wearing a cheese yellow dress. GE says that Amond is Daemon 2.0. Thanks for the super chat from Holmes Brothers, who says that Alicent is more and more corrupt in her increasing belief of the Seven. I mean, Alicent would not be the first person to use religion to see to seem all high and mighty and virtuous, when in actual fact the religion is a is a false cloak disguising uh, sin. I mean, it's like Rhaenyra told Alicent in the previous episode, like, your righteousness is a cloak, it's a disguise, and it's it's an excuse. And I think that the newfound religion that Alicent is wielding is uh, perhaps another cloak. Thanks for the super chat from Nicholas, who says, I'd love to see George Martin appearing on Hot D, just like Stan Lee on Marvel movies. I mean, I would prefer he stays home in New Mexico riding winds, but I mean, you know... He did appear in the uh, Game of Thrones original pilot that got refilmed and he got removed. I, I would love to see the original Game of Thrones pilot, which was apparently a disaster, but it had George Martin wearing a ridiculous hat, so I would like to see it. Rhaenys says something about Stranger to Rhaenyra. Uh, well, the Stranger is the god of death in the religion of the Faith of the Seven, and I think that Rhaenys was saying that, like, you know, I know death because I've lost my both of my children. I think that's what she was saying. Uh, Madison says that when Amond and Daemon stare each other down, Amond shifts his gaze away after trying to hold the stare. Does he have a problem staring people down? Yeah, maybe Amond is a little intimidated by Daemon. So something that I noticed that I liked was that was that Daemon couldn't meet Viserys's eyes when he when he saw how sick he was. Like this scene where Rhaenyra and Daemon come in. Um. I loved how Daemon was so uncomfortable seeing his brother so unwell. Like, look at look at where Daemon's looking. Like, he's avoiding looking at Viserys' face. Rhaenyra looks at Viserys' face, but Daemon is, like, unable to face how unwell his brother is. Like, it hurts him so much. Like, look at him. He's just looking off to the side. Like, Daemon just can't handle it. Like, he glances and then he looks away again. Like, he, he can't deal with his brother being like this. Which I thought was really wonderful acting. I, th I thought, you know, showing Daemon's pain, you know, the man that he admires and loves so much being so unwell is uh, so painful for him. Thanks for the super chat from Otaku, who says that Aemon beat Cole, who beat Daemon. Therefore, in the power rankings, Aemon must be better than Daemon. Hoo <laughs> hoo! Uh, is Cole using a mace a regular thing? Uh, Kristen Cole is best with his Morning Star. Uh, he's better with a morning star than with a sword. Um, Sovitsa got the impression that Viserys had a poppy-induced dragon dream of John and Danny. Hoo hoo! I, I don't think that the milk of the poppy would give you prophetic dreams. I think the milk of the poppy would give you a dreamless sleep. Like they talk about it dulling you, you know. Uh, Patrick says, "Will we see a dragon battle by the end of the season?" Well, I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, like a fortune cookie, I'll say that uh, odds are in your favor. Thanks for the super chat from Jaden, who says, Would you say A Song of Ice and Fire is your favorite fantasy to cover? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think that there's a lot of like unique things about A Song of Ice and Fire that make it great for like making videos about. Like because there is, you know, there's all these shows that you can compare to all the books and there's so many different sort of angles on the books with like the main series and the prequels and the world book and fire and blood and 
Like, A Song of Ice and Fire is so rich with ambiguity, mysteries, like, unresolved issues. I mean, the fact that A Song of Ice and Fire is unfinished is a eternal source of frustration, but it's also an eternal source of discussion, you know? The fact that the books aren't over mean that we can still talk about what might happen, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think A Song of Ice and Fire, you know, it's, it's, it's got a lot going for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's almost like there's a reason we've made more than a hundred Old Shift X videos about the Song of Ice and Fire. I think that's true, if you include the, the, the show videos. Uh, Lewis is heartbroken that Viserys loves Emma. Harold says that the Viserys scenes were beautiful. What a performance from Paddy Considine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we've got to applaud Viserys for his performance. I, I think that Viserys really did bring a lot. To this show, I, and it's going to be sad without him. I, I mean, and you know, the original actors for Alicent and Rhaenyra, as well, Emily and, and Millie, I think were amazing. Um, so it's sad to see those actors go, but uh, I'm enjoying the performances from some of the new actors, like like you know, Amond and, and Helena, and um, there's much more to look forward to. Uh, Malduin says bastards in this world supposedly are untrustworthy, and I'm enjoying that Rhaenyra's bastards are mostly decent people but uh, Alicent's Trueborn children are not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's one of the points in the books as well, is that, you know, people who have prejudice against them, like bastards, um, are not <laughs> are not all evil, you know? Some bastards are dickheads, like Ramsay, but, you know, people are not all the same, and not everyone who is in a social group, especially a fucking made-up social group like bastards, um, you know, some are good, some are bad, not all the same. Uh, Samo, why did you say that name? Battler sent. Are you saying that Alicent was like Batman? I really enjoyed, uh, <laughs> Vaymond saying bastards. Like, he was like, I'm gonna say the truth and I'm gonna say it loud. You guys are bastards. It was fantastic. Uh, Chungus, we've already discussed Helena. I think she's talking about spies in the walls and future events. Jess says, how does Viserys even know about the prophecy? The knowledge was passed down Targaryen heirs, but Jaehaerys was technically never heir, so who taught him? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the weirdnesses of the whole situation of, um, of this whole prophecy being passed down situation. Because, um, like, Viserys says that, oh, you know, Aegon and his heirs have passed down the White Walker dream from, from king to heir for generations. But it's like, well, hang on. Magor stole the throne from Aenys's son, and so then Magor was killed, and then Jaehaerys was like the fourth-born child of Aenys, and he took it despite, you know, him having an elder brother who may have been dead at that point, but then Jaehaerys was, you know, he considered Aemon his heir, but then it was Balon, and then no one considered Viserys, so it is extremely unclear, like, how the information about Aegon's Dream, like, made it through this whole, like, Chinese Whispers telephone game from Aegon to Viserys. Um, and there's even more shenanigans that go on between Viserys and the later kings. So, I think the message may have been garbled um, along the way. And yeah, it is, it's very questionable how exactly uh, the the dream got passed down through the Aegon, Aenys and Magor era especially so uh yeah there are plenty of open questions there it's almost a retcon like it's almost like a show thing that doesn't necessarily fit perfectly with the books but um but yeah uh rodrigo says will we get a face reveal from alt shift x well face reveals you know everyone loves a face reveal right <laughs> everyone i mean it isn't uh you know like the dream youtube channel is perpetually enhanced by the face reveal, right? No one's ever disappointed by a face reveal. Anyway, you don't want to see my eye patch. It's a real doozy. Thanks for the super chat from Melina, who says, Amon's crystal eye. Yeah, what's under the eye patch? What, what, what does he keep in there? Snacks? Maybe? Maybe he's, got, maybe he's got a snack in his eye patch, in his eye socket. Jeffrey says, at the end, between Viserys and Alicent, Viserys says, it's you, and then the look on her face changes. Alicent knows he's talking about Rhaenyra. No, I, I think when Viserys says it's you, Viserys thinks that he's talking to Rhaenyra, and he's saying you, Rhaenyra, are the prince that was promised. I think that's what Viserys meant when he said it's you. And I think that Alicent, in the moment, really did believe that Viserys was talking to her about her son Aegon. But, like, yeah, I think it's very much, like, motivated reasoning. 
Uh, thanks for the super chat from Motaz, who says, Does Rhaenyra actually not know the truth about Lainor? I think that Rhaenyra does know, because, like, Daemon was saying to Rhaenyra, like, set Lainor free. Like, Daemon was saying to Rhaenyra, let's let Lainor live. So, I think Rhaenyra does know Lainor's alive. Uh, Nathalie says, why is incest more accepted in this series than in Game of Thrones? I think the answer for that is that the Targaryens are at the peak of their power, and they have dragons, and they can do what they want. Like George Martin has said, that when you have dragons, you don't have to listen to the church when they say you can't do incest. Um, that they're in a position of power, and so their, their, their rituals have to be more accepted, because no one can, no one can question them at this point. But then later on in Game of Thrones, when the Targaryens fell down, their customs fell with them. And, you know, the Targaryens no longer had dragons later on, so they weren't able to do what they want as much. Uh, Jess says, do you think Amond and Helena are having an affair? Yeah, that would be a parallel to Nerys and um, Amon the Dragon Knight. Um, I mean, Amond did say, like, I would do my duty and I would marry Helena if you didn't, Aegon. So yeah, there is some groundwork there. I don't think there's any evidence for it, but I think that's a interesting theory. I mean, like, Amond is not... <sighs> Amond is not a great guy. <laughs> he, he doesn't show a lot of uh, sensitivity or affection that we've seen. I mean, maybe Helena is, like, the one person who Amond is nice to. I'm sure... I, I can see people shipping that. But, um... Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, there could be a tender side to Amond that he shows to his sister, Helena. Yeah, I mean, look, that would be a very Targaryen thing to do. That would not be unprecedented. Thanks for the super chat from Jaden, who says, The actor who plays Amond needs to play Blood Raven. Ooh, what if Amond is Blood Raven? With time travel? I don't know. Tambi Lee says, Viserys showing up like Jonah Hex at a dinner party. Some of his cheek is missing. Rational says, both sides have good reason to fear what the other might do. Paranoia is the real enemy. And, and you know, the system is the enemy. The political system that, that, you know, puts one bloodline at the top of the others and forces conflict. I think that's part of it too. Um, we're going to answer as many super chats as we can real quick, and then we're going to conclude the live stream. Because uh, it's been almost three hours, my goodness. Flement Brax says, What's the deal with Targaryen death dreams? Amon had similar parallels with Viserys. Yeah, I mean, a Amon, Maester Amon, had some uh, insight about prophecy towards the end of his life in the Game of Thrones books. Um, he sort of realized that Daenerys was the prince that was promised, or he thought so at the end of his life. Uh, Mazaria's motive, she has spies, what game is she playing? Yeah, I don't know, is she going for revenge against Daemon? Is she just going for her own empowerment? Is she working with Otto still? Is she going against Laris? Lots of, lots of things. Uh, Alyssa says, do you think this season ends with a certain event at Storm's End? I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Nathalie says, what about Viserys calling Rhaenyra his only child? Yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, Rhaenyra was Viserys' only child at the time that he named Rhaenyra heir to the throne. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, disinheriting Alicent's children. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I think that Viserys loves Rhaenyra more than he loves Alicent, partly because, you know, Rhaenyra is Emma's daughter. And, you know, parents say that they love all their children equally, but uh, sometimes that's not true. Uh, DC says the three eggs that Daemon pulled were f were for Daenerys in Game of Thrones. Yeah, I mean, if they want to make more connections between House of the Dragon and the original Game of Thrones show, then making those three dragon eggs, the three dragon eggs that Daenerys takes uh, in Game of Thrones, that, that would be cool. I mean, there are theories already about, like, the eggs that Alyssa Farman takes from Dragonstone in Fire and Blood. Like, maybe they are the eggs that... Uh, Daenerys gets because they go to a Pentoshi uh, spice monger, which is, you know, Pentos is where Illyrio has the dragon eggs in Game of Thrones. So I think that it's probably those eggs, Alyssa's eggs, that end up being Daenerys's. But, you know, there's good... There's, there, there's plenty of ambiguity. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Shannon. Lowell says, I don't like the inclusion of prophecy. Um, just a plot device to spark the war. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about them talking about the prophecy since this particular story is not really about the prophecy but there are a few ways that they could tie it in later that might be interesting fernando says is there any lesson to learn that it, 
that someone really ought to disinfect the Iron Throne. Yeah, chuck a bit of Clorox on those rusty-ass blades. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, at least part of Viserys' sickness came from cutting himself on the throne all the time. Like, he had those sores on his back, which, you know, maybe they were, like, fresh cuts from the back of the throne. So, yeah, you got to sit cautiously on that thing. Olivia says that Rhaenys could have been told safely. Yeah, maybe Rhaenyra should have told Rhaenys that her son Lainor was alive. Um, but it's a dangerous truth because, you know, if Lainor is alive, then Rhaenyra's marriage to Daemon is arguably illegitimate, and then uh, Rhaenyra's children with Daemon are arguably illegitimate. Like, yeah, that, that's a new angle, because in the books, Lainor does seem to be dead. But since Lainor is alive in the show, you could argue that Rhaenyra's children with Daemon, Aegon and Viserys, are also bastards. Rhaenyra's children with Harwin are bastards, and arguably her children with Daemon are bastards. So it's bastards all the way down, which has huge political implications. So, my god, it's even more complicated. Thanks for the super chat from Anastasia, who says, Viserys referred to Rhaenyra as my only child in this episode, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, well, she, wa she was the only child when he made her heir. Juan says, Do you think the moon tea was fake and the maid is with the spy? The bastard child is going to be used for some kind of claim on the throne. I, I think that the moon tea was real moon tea, but I think that we should definitely keep an eye on any potential royal bastards. Like the reason, like part of the reason why Alicent was so uh, insistent on preventing this maid from giving birth to any bastard children of Aegon is because you don't want bastard claimants to the throne. It complicates things. Uh, Cannibal has not appeared yet. House of playing with my heart. Eric says, was the king murdered? It looked like he was bleeding. I don't think he was bleeding. I think he was crying on his deathbed there. Um, crying for his dead wife, Emma, I think. Isaac says, despite being at the weakest point from leprosy, Viserys exudes authority just by entering a room. Yeah, I mean, I think that everyone's shocked when he walks into the room because they know how sick he is. And, like, he has not done this. He has not walked or sat on the throne in ages. And so that that alone is like, oh, my God. Because, like, everyone was so comfortable in their little schemes, you know? Like, Vaymond and Otto were working together and they were like, we're going to we're gonna ally, we're going to disinherit Luke, we're going to disinherit Rhaenyra. But then Viserys walks in and says, no, like, I'm still king. I'm still in charge and I'm still in support of Rhaenyra. Uh, Brendan says, my love. Yeah, I think Viserys was talking about Emma. Lowell says, doesn't Bran have a wheelchair at the end of Game of Thrones? So did technology advance? <laughs> well, Bran in Game of Thrones did talk about uh, wheelchair history. And he did talk about a Martell who had a wheelchair. Uh, maybe wheelchairs have not been invented yet. You know, maybe that's too advanced. I feel like, I feel like they probably should have invented wheelchairs by now. Like, I mean, what technology do you need to make a wheelchair? You need a wheel and you need chairs. And we've seen that they do have both wheels and chairs. <laughs> but who knows? Carlos says, medieval dynasties are scary. This could result in so many people dead. In modern times, all these teenagers would just get a spanking and, and it'd be done. Yeah, combining uh, family drama and sexuality with politics is a dangerous mix. And it's a good thing that modern day politics is perfectly rational and, and peaceful and everyone gets along all the time and feelings are not involved and everyone just is kumbaya. Kirawick says, Kiwi Ironic says, Mazaria's neck scar, who cut her throat? Does Mazaria have a neck scar? I don't think I saw that. What was the neck scar? Mazaria. Oh, yeah, okay. I think I'd see what you're saying. It does look like Mazaria has a line on her throat. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know what Mazaria's neck scar is. I, I don't recall Mazaria... I mean, maybe maybe she's always had that, and maybe that's, like, when she was a slave. Maybe she was, like, abused or, like, a, a victim of violence as a slave. Maybe she always had that neck scar. Um, I don't remember seeing it previously, though. It's a little bit mysterious. Did she always have that neck scar? She's got a high collar there. Um, she's got her hair over her neck most of the time. She, well, she, yeah, she's sort of covering her neck previously. So, um, I mean, maybe she's always had the neck scar. Yeah, she's always covering her neck. Maybe they're going to talk about that. Maybe that's a thing. Yeah, interesting. Necklace. Some people are saying, is it a necklace? 
I I think that's on her skin. I don't, I don't think that's a necklace. Uh, are you, all right, people in the chat are saying it's a necklace. All right, maybe we're crazy. Uh, Kiwi asks about Dayron. I think we might see him later. George says, did the sea snake really die? Uh, well, no, they're not saying the sea snake is dead. They're just saying the snake is wounded and might die. G1 says, Rhaenyra doesn't seem aware of Lenor's survival. I think she is aware because Daemon said, let's set Lenor free. Um, I think she just didn't tell Rhaenys. Uh, Zachary says, join the Swifty army to reap incredible rewards. Yeah, well, you know, Alt Swift X, the YouTube channel Alt Swift X is dangerously close to 100,000 subscribers. And I do worry that if uh, people subscribe to Alt Swift X, there, uh, there might be more Alt Swift X videos. And that's the last thing the world needs. Wes says, Aegon is going to drink himself to death. Yeah, well, I mean, he's in a delicate political situation. And being drunk all the time is probably not going to help him make good decisions. Uh, Ina says, how are we feeling about young Eyepatch? I think that everyone is a fan of Amond at this point. OB says that Alicent was on the bad side of Viserys' face. Yeah, we've answered most of this stuff. Um, Aegon, the first crown. Yeah, there was a different crown on the preview. Sea Smoke, I think, is still around. Sorry, we've got to wrap this up because we've been talking for too long. Virginia says... Is Jace a strong? Yeah, like you could speculate that Jaceris might actually be the son of Kristen and Rhaenyra. Maybe Rhaenyra didn't drink that moon tea. Don't know. I, I That would be a big twist to add, but yeah, I don't know. It would be cool. I don't think it's true. Patrick says, do you think that Viserys was seeing Jon Snow at that moment? Yeah, I mean, maybe there was a bit of prophecy dream business going on in Viserys' last moments. I, I, I think... I think he was semi-lucid, though. Like, I think he thought he was talking to Rhaenyra, and I think he was saying Rhaenyra is the prince that was promised, which is just pure Targaryen uh, uh, ego, I think. They all want to think that they or their child is the bloody prince that was promised, like Viserys. Prax says, thank you for these videos and live streams. It's become the Sunday ritual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pax. William says, Viserys climbing the throne was emotional. I agree. Austin says that Rhaenyra has matured since the beginning. She really has. She really has. Like, Rhaenyra was like an impetuous teenager, and now she is a lot more serious about her responsibilities. Um, Alicent was kind of always serious about her responsibilities. I think Alicent has become a little bit more sinister in her sort of manipulations and her determination. So yeah, and, and Daemon, I think, has mellowed out as well. So yeah, I mean, the, the whole time skip thing is a tricky thing to handle, but I think that they um, are doing a good job with it. Uh, Salchi Papa says that Kristen Cole hasn't aged. Yeah, it. I wish that they made Kristen Cole age. I mean, they could just put a little bit of grey in his hair, or like grow grow out a salt and pepper beard or something. Uh, I agree that it's silly that Kristen hasn't aged. Cosmic says that Azora High will come from the north. I think he said the winter will come from the north, and I agree that Vaymond is sympathetic. Jacob says that Amond and Daemon's yeah, they look similar, yeah. I mean, ooh, what if Daemon lost an eye? What if... And then, like, he had an eye patch. Wouldn't that be cool? The eye patch brothers. Matt says that the Greens seem more evil, but Alicent is genuinely upset about the conflict. The government and culture are the real problems. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that they have a very bad system that contributes to these uh, conflicts. And I think that, you know, Alicent gets angry at Rhaenyra when she should probably get... She probably should be more angry at the whole monarchical system itself. Uh, symmetry in A Song of Ice and Fire. Ice and Fire, Rainer and Baylor, Varus and Laris. I mean, if we want to get numerological, I mean, the, the, there's <laughs> there's twos in everything. Um, n nature, nature loves symmetry. Everyone has two eyes. Everyone's got two arms, unless you're Viserys. Keplin says, when Daemon walked to the throne, I'd never wanted to hear the words so bad, I love you, brother. Yeah, it seemed like Daemon and Viserys might actually say something to each other. And I wonder if Daemon might, you know, later regret not having told his brother he loved him in the end. I think I think the impact of Viserys' death is going to be huge on Daemon. Username says, why is murder in the Red Keep so normalized? Yeah, bloody Joffrey Lonmouth and Vaemon Valerion just fucking murdered on the floor. I think that, you know, when when you're Daemon Targaryen, the rogue prince, you can get away with it. I think Kristen getting away with Joffrey Lonmouth was a bit more ridiculous. Uh, Sobate says, Jace looks like Kristen. 
Yeah, well, I, I think that the hair color between Jace and Luke is different. Like, like Jace and Luke do look different. And yeah, I agree. J- Jace's hair color does look a bit more like Kristen's, whereas Luke's looks a bit more like Harwin. So, you know, maybe you could take that as evidence that Jace might secretly be Kristen's son, not Harwin's. Thanks for the super chat from Andrew, who says, I feel bad for Viserys. I want to see him happy. Lenny says, Viserys' reaction to his family's moment of happiness was agonizing. Yeah, there was so much pathos with Viserys and Daemon. Osu says it was very appropriate having Alicent on, on the decaying side of Viserys' face. William says, if Viserys ordered Jaceris to marry both Bela and Helena, thus legalizing polygamy and uniting the black and green lines, that would be hilarious. But I think that, you know, it wouldn't solve everything to just marry everyone to everyone else. Because, you know, people might have favorite spouses. I mean, it's a bit like when Aegon the Conqueror married both Rhaenys and uh, Visenya, but then Rhaenys' child Aenys was an enemy of Visenya's child Maegor, you know? Like, marrying everybody to everybody does not necessarily end all rivalries. Kill Me says, who ordered the roast pig for Aemond? I wonder if Luke might have actually specifically requested the roast pig for Aemond. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. Like, like Luke does have this sort of, like, sneaky snicker, so maybe he was behind it. He's, he's such a little prankster, Lukey. Such a little prankster. Might just start a war. Josh says, this whole thing is a good warn- warning against naming everyone Aegon. Yeah. Yeah, if the names weren't all the same, Alicent might not have been confused about all the different Aegons in the end. Talked about Helena. We talked about that. Flawless says, no more in extreme pain. Talking about what, like Robert, Lyanna? Feebot says, I haven't even watched the episode, but I'm equally excited for your live streams. Thank you, Feebot. Glad you enjoy. Okay. We are going to have a super quick glance at the, on the next episode preview, and then we're going to end this live stream, and then we're going to start working on the explained video, uh, which will be the proper edited scripted video. So make sure you press like and subscribe. Uh, You might also like to subscribe to the podcast feeds. There's a podcast feed that has these live streams on it, so you can listen on Spotify or whatever. You can even buy an Alt-Shift-X t-shirt if you'd like, or an Alt-Shift-X badge. You could put an Alt-Shift-X badge on an Alt-Shift-X t-shirt. I think that would look great. Uh, You also can uh, press like and subscribe, and now we're going to look at the preview. All right, here's the next episode. So if you do not want to see the on the next episode preview trailer, you may wish to avert your gaze. Um, Joanna says, when will the explained video be uploaded? Uh, it'll be around Friday or Saturday or Sunday. One of those days. It'll be done as uh, it'll be done when it's done. There's a lot of work goes on goes into these videos and it takes time, but uh, I'll try and get it to you all as soon as we can. Uh, we see the throne looking dark and ominous. Who will sit the throne after Viserys' death is obviously the big question. Uh, we have a meeting among the Greens deciding what to do after the death of Viserys. Uh, he told me he wished for Aegon to be king. Oh, Alicent. That's not true. That's a fib. Viserys did not say Alicent's son Aegon should be king. Viserys said that Rhaenyra is the prince that was promised, according to Aegon's dream. Alicent chose to hear what she wanted to hear. That's, I think that's pretty, pretty damning on Alicent. I'd like to see the context of this, but I think it's pretty damning for Alicent to be supporting Aegon right now. Uh, thanks, uh, and then, (laughs) I said that automatically. Uh, and then there's a commotion. I guess the common people... I mean, I would I would have liked to have seen more from the common people because the common people are relevant. So I'm glad we're seeing what the common people think of all this. Who will they support? I mean, Rhaenyra was once called the Realm's Delight. Will they support Rhaenyra? Will they support whatever the Greens do? Let's find out. People are being made to swear and kneel. Who are they being made to swear to, I wonder? Hey, well, it'll, it'll be to Aegon. The Greens are supporting Aegon. That's what's going on here. Um, and none can know who you are or what you seek. Who is that? There's like a bearded man 
that Otto is talking to. Is Otto working with Mazaria? Is this some, like, secret, sh secret shady agent of Mazaria? Or is that Laris Strong's agent? Maybe Laris Strong's person. I think that Otto might be, like, sending messages out to other lords and kingdoms, trying to rally support behind Aegon. But, yeah, what is this secret mission? Very curious. Oh, is that the Kingsguard? Oh, is that Arik or Eric? Yeah, I guess that's Arik or Eric. And Otto was saying, you got to lock everything down. Got to lock up Rhaenys, because since Rhaenys is sympathetic to the Blacks, you've got to lock up Rhaenys so that she doesn't go out and support Rhaenyra. Uh, Talia, the handmaiden, is being locked up. So I guess... I guess Mazaria is not working with Otto. I guess Mazaria is, um, you know, we know that Talia is working with Mazaria, so I guess um, Otto knows that and doesn't want Talia to tattle. And they ask what to do about Rhaenyra, who is on Dragonstone while all this is going on. Uh, someone's jumping over some rocks. That looks like a good time. Laris has found out something, uh, and it's about a blonde-haired kid. So that is probably a bastard son of Aegon. Alicent's son, and uh, that's what Alicent was trying to prevent, but it's happened. There's a bastard out there. So will Alicent have this bastard child killed, like Cersei killed Joffrey, killed Robert's bastards? Who knows? Or maybe that'll be a relevant character later on. Uh, Kristen pulls out a sword and points it at Harold Westerling. Oh god, I really hope that Kristen doesn't kill Harold Westerling. Harold Westerling is such a good guy, but would Harold Westerling allow the Greens to do what they're about to do? Ooh boy. Kristen is, is such a fucking loose unit. There is little that he won't do. Um, talk of treason. Looks like uh, the Beesbury is opposing the Greens uh, power grab. I hope that doesn't end badly for the Beesbury. We got some uh, dragons of cloth. We were talking, Helena said earlier, about the dragons of cloth and the dragons of thread. Uh, so these might be the dragons of cloth that she foresaw. So is that, like, someone throwing Aegon around? What's going on there? Uh, people filing into the dragon pit for the coronation of Aegon. That'll be fun. I'm sure that'll go great. Otto, all of Otto's plans and schemes are culminating. We're getting to the business end. We're getting to the pointy end now. Shit's getting real. So, uh, my god, thank you for joining in this live stream. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the on the preview stuff because there's plenty to talk about in the uh, current episode. So uh, we're gonna make the video about episode eight. Just th just two more episodes left after eight, nine, and ten. So uh, my god, it's uh, it's been fun. Uh, please like and subscribe, and uh, comment below what kinds of questions and topics you want included in the explained video. And uh, thank you everybody for the super chats. I apologize for any super chats that I may have missed. Did as many as I could. It's been a long live stream. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Cheers.